Yeah, thanks, Paul, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's early in the morning for me, but John gave me a call just to make sure that I'm here. And uh, so we will continue with the sessions um, of, of lectures that I've given. Uh, the one that I have uh, for you today to start today is not in the same screen format as the, all the other ones. I simply didn't have time to uh, to get it to that larger landscape format, but it follows a similar principle in terms of the way I present the data. I try to explain things as I go along. And in this case, we start, uh, so this is the, the, the type of things that I want to cover. That's also in the, in the abstract. Um, it's quite technical stuff, um, but I hope I, I can bring the message across with the examples that I've chosen um, to, to discuss. And we start this, this, this conversation by looking at uh, the thermal evolution of our planet. Um, we all know that in the, uh, the rock record, there's evidence of early accretion of planetesimals, um, and then the Earth heated up as a result of that, uh, that of uh, radiogenic heat production, which is what you can see on this dotted curve over here. And that radiogenic heat production has decayed with time, uh, to the effect that the temperatures that we see in the mantle have, you know, according to three different models that I've compiled over here, have peaked roughly about 3 billion years ago. That's why this big orange dot is over there. And since that time, uh, the Earth has cooled down. And the way we see that expressed um, in the mantle is that the, the adiabat has actually changed. It used to be around uh, 1500 degrees centigrade, uh, about 3 billion years ago, that's in the mid Archean, and has cooled to 1330 degrees today. Um, and it's a fairly linear path uh, going from 3 billion years to, uh, to today. And one of the ways we see that in the rock record is that commodietic melts um, are very high magnesium. They require very high melting temperatures. And we know that they are restricted to the Archean uh, rock record to a large degree. Um, but this has, this has also had a profound effect um, into the residues that have been produced as a result of melting in the mantle. And those are the residues that are today uh, carried in the lithospheric roots. And so we see evidence of this process unfolding uh, through geological age. Um, and I'll show you the examples of that. Um, that's the basis of a large proportion of this talk. Um, so how does that work? If you take a, a, a standard piece of, of fertile mantle, the bulk composition of that fertile mantle will have about 48% olivine, 32% uh, orthopyroxene, 18% clinopyroxene, and 2% spinel. It's a spinel heart uh, uh, lozolite, fertile lozolite. It's quite pyroxene rich and olivine poor when it's a fertile piece of mantle. In other words, it looks like a chondritic um, uh, reservoir. And that plots over here in the standard rock classification diagram. If you start melting, a fertile piece of mantle. I'm just going to turn my video off here. If you start melting this fertile piece of mantle, um, the first thing you will extract is clinopyroxene that sits over here. And so the residue will move away from clinopyroxene. It'll move in this direction over here until you exhaust clinopyroxene at this line. And then you have to melt the next uh, most meltable uh, fraction of the rock, which is orthopyroxene. That sits over here. When you extract orthopyroxene from the rock, you drive the residue up towards olivine rich earth compositions. And ultimately, you create from a lozolite a rock that we call a hartsburgite, and then ultimately from a hartsburgite to a dunite. Um, and so you make the rock olivine rich as a result. Um, and the residue then becomes what we call a depleted residue or a residual fraction, a refractory rock type. The melts that you produce as a result of this process will live at the bottom of the triangle over here. 
they will be rich in clinopyroxine in particular in the initial, and but they will also start having uh, orthopyroxine. These rocks are called peroxonites. If you have them in the mantle, uh, if they erupt at surface, we will call them um, basically foliated basalts. So this is the process of how you extract uh, basaltic melt out of pyrolithite and um, produce a depleted residue. And as I've said, the nature of that process has changed with time. This is another way of looking at um, uh, that process um, from melting experiments that, that were done in, uh, by Koshiro in Japan. Um, and it just emphasizes the nature of the exhaustion of these different phases with increasing temperature and the residues that remain. So you will have a lizolytic residues up to about 20% uh, melt extraction. From there onwards, a hot spaghetti residue up to about 40% 40, 40, 40 melt extraction. And from there onwards, you'll have a donut. Now, if we put earth temperatures or adiabatic temperatures through time on the same diagram, oh, and ultimately you, you'll melt olivine out, but that'll happen at uh, very high temperatures. If you put those, um, uh, the adiabatic temperatures through time on the same diagram, then you'll see that 3 billion years ago, so in the mid archean the, the adiabat was hot enough to actually produce residues that are largely dunites. And then as the earth um, has become aged, as it's aged and it's become younger in, in geological time, the capacity of the adiabat to produce dunites has decreased. By the time we get to the mid Proterozoic, uh, you can't produce dunite as a residue anymore. You can do Hartsburgites. And today, you can hardly um, produce Hartsburgite as a residue. Most of the residues we see today are, are lizolytic residues. Um, and so, in the roots of Archean cratons, which are you know, this age over here, roughly two and a half billion years ago, we expect to find uh, evidence that there was, that there was uh, melt extraction to the extent that you produced dunitic residues. Uh, in terms of whole rock chemistry, um, one of the major signals that we can see of this process, starting with a prim primitive mantle or an asthenosphere and uh, extracting uh, the melt out of it, um, it's an almost linear process in terms of calcium and also aluminium content, but there are other things that are going on in the background as well. The residual depleted mantle has higher magnesium over iron, so it's more magnesium. It has low aluminium, as we can see here, aluminium gets extracted and therefore has a higher chrome, so a higher chrome to aluminium ratio, low calcium, also has low titanium. Um, but this is a very useful um, vector. You can either measure calcium or aluminium in the bulk rock system, and you'll have a linear approximation of how much melt is. So why do we choose garnet to monitor all these processes? Um, and it's the title for my talk. It's the perfect proxy for mantle rocks because it occurs in a very wide range of rock types. We've seen that, peridotite, peroxide, ectodite, also megacrysts. Garnet has a wide pressure temperature stability field, including across graphite diamond. So that's important from uh, our perspective. And we can also retrieve major element data. And as we have seen yesterday, temperature and pressure data at low unit cost. So it's a very useful proxy to have in the toolbox um, when you want to go and monitor stuff. In addition, the formula for a garnet, it has, um, beside the silica site and the oxygen site. Um, it's a cubic mineral, but it has two sites that are largely independent of each other. On the X site, you find magnesium, iron, and calcium. And on the Y site, you find aluminum and chrome. And so you can monitor a whole range of different things in these two sites, um, and they reflect different, uh, different attributes that you can that you can extract from that from that garnet structure. So, for instance, the magnesium number reflects the olivine uh, olivine content or the whole rock magnesium number. Uh, the calcium number on the X site reflects the presence of orthopyroxine and clinopyroxine. 
There's minor manganese and nickel that's useful for mantle thermometry. Uh, on the Y side, you can uh, monitor the chrome number. Um, and that reflects the presence of chromite or the whole rock chrome number. Uh, Ketani, um, you're quite loud in the, in the background here. Can you switch off your mute, please? Um, and then on the Y side, there's minor ferric iron content, which reflects the, the oxygen free acid in the mantle. In addition, this is a very interesting uh, aspect of garnet stoichiometry. You can measure the ratio of the Y to the X site which is the ratio of chrome to calcium. And as I'll show you later, that's a barometer. So to have all these capacities encapsulated in one mineral, um, it's very useful from the single mineral approach. Um, and you can monitor a variety of different things. And what I'll be showing you now is how it reflects uh, the aging of our planet. So here's our standard chrome calcium diagram. Um, if you go to uh, an alkali basalt uh, source uh, where there's thin and hot lithosphere on the current in the present day, uh, there will be no diamonds associated with that, um, with that setting. Um, you will find a fertile garnet composition in your garnet concentrate, which will be situated in this, um, in this part of the diagram right here. That's where fertile mantle plots. And these data sets come from places like Paliaiki, the Antarctic, Vitim, in Siberia, China, Mongolia. We've got lots of uh, these, this kind of data set over here. Low chrome, garnet, with a, a reasonable amount of calcium in them. Um, and the assemblage here will be olivine, orthopyroxene, clinoporoxene, garnet. If you now extract a little bit of melt out of that um, fertile bulk composition, as was the case uh, for the mantle underlying Gibeon, but there are also other places that you can find these kind of garnet patterns. Um, the setting will be marginal kimberlite, sometimes we call them melnoids, uh, thin lithospheres, mid protrozoic, no diamonds associated. That's the kind of garnet pattern you, you, you see. Um, and if you take that process even further, you extend this all the way up the lithosphere trend over here. The setting will be have kimberlites in it. The lithosphere can be quite thick. The age of the overlying craton will be late Archean, early Proterozoic. It's what I call a lurzolite dominant mantle, all the way up the lurzolite trend. Sometimes you find diamonds in them in there. Uh, they're often associated with the eclogitic fraction, which is down here on the diagram. This particular example is from Sloan Nix. That's uh, on the southern end of the Wyoming craton. But you can also find these kind of patterns in Finland, Prairie Creek, Mashgawan in India, Kundalungu in uh, uh, the, the central, central part of the DRC. So this range over here represents 5 to 20% melt extraction. Clinoporoxene is still present. It's not been exhausted. And therefore, all the garnet compositions lie within the lozolite field. But if you take it a step further, you're now going to exhaust clinoporoxene and you get these kind of garnet patterns. You now step out of the clinoporoxene stable field and into this field over here. You start producing hartsburgites as a residue. The settings are typically kimberlites, 200 kilometer lithosphere, typically archaean. You start seeing hartsburgite being a significant component of the garnets that you recover in these settings. The diamonds are normally peritritic and also some eclogitic ones. This particular plot comes from Shandong in China. These are 550 million year old kimberlites. Uh, these are the garnet uh, patterns that you see out of Shandong, but you can also find these, these kind of patterns in Botswana, Kuruman, Bujimai in the DRC, uh, in Mali, and then also on the Southern Slave. And it represents five, to about 30% melt extraction. I've put a red line in here. It's an oceanal vertical red line. It's situated at, you know, I just put it in at 1.8 weight percent calcium. It could be at about two, it could be about one weight percent calcium. This is an oceanal line where you see orthopyroxene disappearing. And on the other side of this line would be dunites. 
So this is the heart spadite field over here. Once you exhaust orthopyroxene in the source, you will be, be, be producing an olive-enriched rock. And that's what you see uh, in settings like Siberia, where this data set comes from. It's from Ikal and Udechnaya. And I've actually added some, artificially added some ectodite at the bottom here. But you also see these kind of patterns in the Western Kavval at Venetia uh, and the Central Slave Crater. So you associate them with kimberlites, thick lithospheres, early to mid Archean settings. Um, you see a strong heart spaghetti signal. And then you start seeing dunite being present. Uh, the diamonds that are associated with these type of settings are pyrolytic and also exogenic. And just notice over here at the top, we're talking here about OPX art at about 40% melting that drives your garnet compositions right down to these low calcium uh, very, very characteristic compositions of um, melt extraction under extremely high temperatures, which are typically archaea. So the process is then um, schematically illustrated by these yellow arrows. You can read about this. These diagrams, in fact, come from a paper that I published uh, in 99, um, uh, while I was with still the beers, uh, with the beers, and most of these data sets were were available to me as a, as a function of the database that the beers had available to us. There's a different way of looking at the same thing. So the chrome calcium plot has its uses in um, 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 in, in recognizing different uh, residues that are sitting in the roots of cratonic, uh, the cratons. Um, but you can also look at the magnesium number of the same, uh, of, the, of garnets to monitor the same process. Here I've used the, the garnet calcium intercept values that I explained uh, yesterday as a monitor of whether you are in the Lerzolite field on the right or the Hartsburgite field on the left. And I've just plotted the phosphorite content of olivine that coexists with garnet as a monitor of the magnesium number. And this is based on uh, mantle zenoliths from, uh, from my database, uh, from Kapval and Lesotho. On this diagram, fertile mantle would plot over there. Um, and if you do the, do the same extraction process, you'll first um, extract clinoporoxine until you exhaust clinoporoxine. Then you'll cross the boundary into the hotspotite field and go all the way up to the dunite field over here, less than about 1.8 weight, 1.8 on the garnet calcium intercept number, um, and phosphorite contents that are around 95. Uh, so you start with the phosphorite content near 89, it's about 88.5. Uh, it goes up to about 93, and then all the way up to 95 over there. At the same time, you're exhausting uh, titanium very quickly. Titanium partitions into the melt. And so the residue very rapidly has zero titanium, and that's this yellow arrow over here. But there's something else going on on this diagram over here. There's a whole lot of data that has much more titanium. And the reason for that is this depleted residue has, um, has experienced some metasomatism. Titanium has been added back into the system and it's done so uh, with characteristic a slope like this. As you add titanium, you're also adding iron and calcium. And so this metasomatism has this very particular uh, arrays that you see on these kind of diagrams. And uh, Andy Moore will be very happy to see that megacrysts are represented. They basically are metasomatic um, um, additions to what is a fertile system to begin with. So megacrysts are uh, evidence of refertilization of, of the mantle. Um, and they play a particular role in, in defining what happens in the bottom end of this diagram over here. Okay, so uh, I've armed you with, um, with some examples of how to interpret a chrome calcium diagram. Here's one that, um, that um, we can interpret right now. We can treat it as an unknown. I obviously know where this comes from. But if you, if you were receiving this, 
um, a chrome calcium diagram, which is actually very well populated. There's 47,000 data points on this, uh, on this graph. And it's just an illustration of the nature of the data sets that are available to us these days. You can interpret this diagram in terms of the sources uh, that, pushing out, that are pushing out these garnets as xenocrysts. And in this case, you will choose a kimberlitic source because an alkali basalt source would be restricted to this bottom, to this bottom corner over here. You can interpret it in, in terms of the extent of depletion. Uh, in this case, you will, you will argue it would have gone from 5% depletion all the way up to about 20% depletion, clinoparoxin out uh, into the Hartsbergite field. Um, and there are three different variants of that process represented on this diagram. There's a Hartsbergite field that has generated, been generated over here. There's another one that's been generated over there. And there's another one that's generated over here at very high chrome contents. Notice that all three of these do not pass materially beyond this boundary over here. So the proportion of dunite that you expect in, the, in, the, in this lithospheric residue is actually quite restricted. And it's not like the Carbval or, or, or Yakutia. Uh, the extent of depletion that we see on this particular data set did not go all the way that, uh, to, to um, to zero calcium in a garnet. Uh, it's a very subtle signal, but we'll see some differences in other uh, chrome calcium plots that you'll see this morning, uh, where you should look for, for what's going on in this part of the diagram over here, because it tells us the age of the mantle. You can simply look at this, your chrome calcium plot and say to yourself, huh, I think this is an Archean mantle, but it's not as old in the Archean as we see elsewhere in, on our planet. And so maybe it's a mid-Archean mantle um, as opposed to an early Archean mantle. I don't know that there is much more that I could discuss in terms of, uh, of, of you know, lithospheric age, but we can put, already put some potential diamond associations on this plot, uh, obviously, uh, there would be a peritic diamond association, but there's also a potential for an ecligitic diamond association sitting at the bottom of this diagram over there. Um, and so all the, all the information we need uh, in terms of a regional assessment is, is available to us just, just, just simply by looking at this chrome calcium diagram. But wait, there's more. The diagram has a lot to offer. And some of you will have noticed that there are these sloping lines on this diagram. I pointed them out a bit earlier. Those are a function, and they're, they're sloping in chrome and calcium content. Those are a function of the presence of chromite. And once that happens, you can uh, squeeze some pressures out of the diagram. Um, and those pressures then relate to the depth of which the depleted lithosphere um, extends to. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to, I did this work in about 1994, 90, I think. Um, and I was fortunate to be able to publish it. Uh, thank you for De Beers for, for allowing me to do that. Um, this is the diagram that came out as a result. These are minimum pressure uh, pressures calibrated against graphite diamond um, for assemblages that look like this, where you have chromite coexisting with a garnet and it either has either diamond in it in a peridotitic setting, either diamond in it, or in the case of the material down here, uh, graphite in it. And these are very linear relationships. So I formulated the barometer simply in weight percent because it's so easy to apply uh, on this diagram, which is also stated in weight percent. Uh, of course, the academics don't, uh, they espouse this approach. Um, uh, they would much rather see this uh, formulated in thermodynamic terms, but this is a very simple and effective way of, of conveying the barometric information that's available to us uh, from this chrome calcium diagram. So somebody did ask the question yesterday in the chat, how do we know when a garnet coexists with a chromite? And the answer is, in general, you don't. 
So if we go backwards over here, you would never know that that garnet composition does or does not coexist with chromite. The only way that you will know that there is chromite coexistence ongoing in your data set is when you see these sloping arrays, like that one over there, or these ones over here. So let's go forward again. When you do have chromite coexisting with garnet, the pressure you get is a real pressure. If you don't know that, in other words, if you don't see those sloping arrays in your crude calcium plot, the pressure you have is a minimum pressure, and that is the general case. Um, it's a very special case that you actually have the information available to you when garnet coexists with chromite. Um, there's a little um, uh, uh, calibration detail which I'd like to share with you. Uh, when I did this work initially, I had a particular data set from uh, the Cleave Kimberlite um, that Bruce Wyatt investigated. He gave me this data set to look at, and it had the sloping line on it uh, inside the Lurzolite field, but it's not a very well, uh, well constrained line uh, in the sense that, you know, there's no data down here on the line. Um, and I used it with reservation. Uh, I've recently come across a paper that was published by some Russian uh, scientists where they look at um, the lamprites from the Elden Shield. Um, this is the chrome calcium diagram that these guys have now published. There's 1,200 data points here. Um, they've put out a data set with a line that goes all the way down here. And I'm pleased to report that their line is consistent with, with the sloping line that I um, fitted to the Cleave data set without any modification. So I'm very happy that these data sets are still coming out. There are additional bits and pieces that come out of this uh, data set that's now being published. For instance, what are the, all these data points doing sitting on that line over there? Um, and what's this single data point doing up here? Um, there, it's, uh, there's some resolution that's, uh, that's happening in this part of the diagram that I am personally interested in because there's some sloping lines that go upwards like that, which I believe are a result of spinel saturation in the Wurlite field, but that's a topic for another con conversation. So, We've come to the point in, in the talk where we can uh, discuss, discuss two chrome calcium plots. We've already done this one uh, with 47,000 data points on it. Um, here's another one that was published. It has 17,000 data points on it. Uh, so that's a full representation of the residue that's sitting in the lithospheric keel somewhere on our planet. Um, and we now have a toolbox that we can assess what this chrome calcium plot is telling us. So first of all, um, how deep is this depleted lithosphere? Uh, this one over here, that garnet composition is telling you it's larger than 60 kilovolts deep. That's, uh, that's quite deep. That's well into the diamond stability field on a normal geotherm. And if you don't believe that number, if you think that's a freak number, well, you can pick any one of these over there and you'll get numbers like 58 or 57 kilobars. Um, so, you know, it's a mutually self-consistent plot. This is a deep lithosphere. It would extend into the diamond stability field uh, on a normal geotherm. Uh, it hasn't had the depletion history that we often associate with Archean cratons. Um, there's a lot of lurzolite in the section. Um, and there's a minor amount of Hartsbergite in the section. And there's no dunite. So this is potentially a protozoic lithosphere. This might not be an Archean lithosphere. Um, and it doesn't diminish the fact that um, you would still uh, be associating uh, diamonds with this part of the diagram and also with this part of the diagram down here. But the nature of the diamond mineralization and how that has come about will be different in terms of history uh, from a lithosphere like this. 
Um, and we'll see this diagram on the right hand side again a little bit later this morning. The one on the left here I can now reveal, this is a, the chrome calcium plot that the, represents the root of the slave craton that Herb Helmstead talked about uh, two days ago in this course. Um, and it has a structure where we have one set of depleted materials up to 61 kilobars. Uh, that's, uh, that's quite deep in the, in the, and it's spinel saturated, so we know it's a real pressure. Um, and we don't see any evidence for depleted material deeper than that in the slave. This is a well populated data set. This is the limit of where we're going to see these kind of pressures. There's another depleted layer that uh, extends up to about 53 kilobars. That's again a real pressure. It's inside the diamond stability field and it is responsible for a lot of the diamonds on the slave. A lot of the diamonds that you see on the slave are, re are related to this layer of depleted lithosphere. There's another set of uh, depleted lithosphere that goes in the range 38 to 42 kilobars. Uh, you could just see there's a density change in this diagram over here. Uh, this layer actually, you know the thermometry of this layer, it sits in the graphite stability field underneath the slave. And there are very few diamonds associated with these kind of compositions. Um, in the slave. And that was a big surprise to the industry that we could get uh, a lot of uh, hard spaghetti uh, material so shallow in the mantle section. Um, and as we'll see later on, it's not unique to the slave. There's another setting where, where that has also occurred. Perhaps on this diagram, uh, the sources for these kind of, um, uh, these kind of garnets uh, are obviously kimberlites, they're not alkali basalts. Uh, alkali basalts don't sample the mantle at these kind of pressures. The only melt that does that uh, is a kimberlite. And I think there's time for some discussion or questions. Just to kick off, Herman, where does all that data for the slave come from? Is that stuff from all the work being done there by the various companies and put on open file again? It's open file. Mm. Uh, so, in fact, the person who compiled all that data was John Armstrong, who is now with um, um, Lucara Diamonds. He's their diamond guy at, uh, at Karoi. Yeah. Yeah. He, did, he did all that work. Mm. I can remember the day when they released that open file. Everybody was just mobbing John Armstrong for the, for this, for the CD-ROM. And it yeah. was free. And and as as it can you put put it to sort of spatial context too? Remember Herb talked oh, yeah. about sort of the west and the east. Oh yeah, I mean if every you, if sample, you, hmm? every every data every data point that's on that graph has a yeah. sample position associated with it. Okay, so 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 if you go back to that diagram, where would the sure. the western side would be presumably then more in the graphite area, where Herb said there were no you know no diamondiferous pipes. So yeah, I, I should have actually put a map up here. Normally I would. I, um, so we'll let uh, you off this time. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, this signal that we see over here, this this very depleted shallow signal, mm. is in the central part of the slave. Okay. Uh, it's underlying. So if you go, if you drill down at Diavik and Ikari, um, that's where all this data comes from. Okay. So it's mostly. Yeah, if you go to the northern slave, it's completely absent. Hmm. Okay. And if you go to the southern slave, it's also completely absent. Hmm. It's sandwiched. It's a it's a very particular feature, sandwiched in the middle of the slave. Was, yeah, it was that long belt that he showed us, sort of yeah. you know, with fault bounded on either side, yeah. structurally um, bounded. Yeah. Okay, and 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 at a guesstimate, I mean, where where would the carp valve sort of Kimberley blocks it again? Would you see a similar profile? I mean, you've looked at enough data. Look, uh, unfortunately, we don't have the open file data for the carp valve. Yeah. Um, the closest I can get to there is a there is a data set that Dion de Brain put together uh, for the CGS for the Council for Geoscience in South Africa from alluvials. So that was a sampling of the Western Cobalt alluvials, okay. yeah. and it looks 
it looks kind of similar, but it doesn't have this this layered structure that you have in the in the in the, this sort of def, definite layered structure that you have um, in the slave craton. I think that was a big surprise to everybody. That ultimately, when we compiled all the bits and pieces across the whole slave craton, that there was so much diversity in the lithospheric section in the slave craton. Um, if you condition yourself with a carb vol craton. You don't expect to see these kind of relationships um, uh, elsewhere. I think perhaps um, if we can go back here, this is um, this is a, a data set for Icol and Ujitnaya. There was going to be my so next the, question. What about Russia? Yeah. yeah so this is basically uh, this is Russia. Mm. Um, this is what the the uh, I forget the name of the. The, the name of the craton, the Russian craton, but it's the, the Yakutian craton. That's but yeah. that's what it looks like. The carp vol is not dissimilar. Okay. And that's what I, was, I say here. The other examples of this kind of pattern is the Western carp vol, Venetia, and the central portion of the slope. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. <clears throat> So, so, so effectively, I mean, you you end up developing sort of macro tools to, you know, un better understand the the cratonic setting as well. Yeah, I mean, this is a it's a diagram. It's remarkable, right? That mm. garnet happens to be stable across this whole pressure range uh, inside. Cratonic roots, and you can record all of these attributes simply by looking at a chrome calcium diagram. And then, um, and then, just getting back to the question yesterday on on the dunnarts or the you know the really refractory stuff. Well, there you go. There they yeah. are. Yeah. And who are the people that have described dunnarts in list, and from which locality? Mm. The Russians described Russian. dunnarts in list. Some of them with diamonds in them from Udachnaya. There's yeah. the evidence that they should exist. And if you do, if you look at the garnet compositions from those Danite Zinglas, they're down here. Yeah, very, very refractory, very, yeah. very um, chrome rich, very low calcium. And just to take that point a little bit further, the phosphorite content of the Danite Zinglas is FO95. FO94 to <clears throat> FO95. That's these kind of these kind of compositions. Interesting. So 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 where 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 are the next cratons that we should be looking at, or, or these are really unique cratons? I've developed a view. Uh, uh, just to answer that question very shortly, I've developed a view that every craton is unique. Every craton is different. Correctly. Every craton is different. Yeah, they have you know they have generic um, they have generic features that are shared, but the nature of how they've been compiled and assembled through time um, and how they represent to us today, each one has a unique history. Well, that fits perfectly. So I mean, you go back to Clifford's rule, you know, as a as a sort of broad. Um, rule of thumb at that point in time with the knowledge that was available and when was that back in the 70s mm -hmm. you know he, 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 it was a it was a very useful tool but you know credit to you and others and the russians and so on i mean this process has moved on with leaps and bounds Cl tom clifford was nine papers 1966 okay thanks paul and um, it's really interesting for the younger kids around here that um, you know that took at least 15 years for general acceptance when you think about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, plate tectonics was in its infancy at that time, and it took many years before that was accepted as well. Yeah. A far different pace of acceptance of uh, of new ideas today than uh, than there was in those days i think but but again herman i mean thanks for your your insight and and i guess you know what you've shown is the importance of big data well yeah. yes uh, and remember that when i published this paper in 1999 
I had access to the big data that the beers had. Yeah. So um, the power of big data is enduring. Um, and you know, credit to the beers for allowing me to put, put these kind of concepts uh, into, into a publication. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, again, credit to you that you know you've continued to build these data sets and your other colleagues, you know, in Canada and John Armstrong, and you know, you can now look at it from a from um, further the further evolution of the process. Yeah, so I think I, I think the you know the, the whole Canadian setup has changed the nature of the industry, and in large part as a result of the fact that you know people have to publish their microdiamond results, people have to um, file assessment reports. Those assessment reports become uh, public domain information, um, and people are hungry for knowledge. Yeah. No, I think absolutely. I mean, you know, love it, to, love it or not. I mean, the Canadian approach to, you know, transparency, and I guess that's the, you know, that's one of the upsides of having lots of juniors who need to move their share price. You know, so every time you found a diamond or a micro diamond, you announced it. Um, but it does have its benefits as well. It's yeah. a it's a functionality of a vibrant junior sector, John. I think that's a very fair that's a very fair point to make. Mm -hmm. How do the fragments of megacrystic garnets feature in the various garnet plots? Okay. Hi, Jürgen. You're back again with a good question. Um, so megacrystic actually plots slightly over here. They slightly higher calcium than, than the uh, depleted mantle material. They represent a more fertile uh, 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 composition and they're, ad they're an addition to depleted mantle. So they, they, they don't belong inside the depleted mantle spectrum. And so much of the talks that I've, 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 I have not spoken about megacrysts uh, to a significant degree, because they represent, a, a, if you think about it, a metasomatic addition, and it's a fertile metasomatic addition. Um, I did point them out on, I did point them out on this diagram over here, and you can see that, you know, this is fertile mantle. It doesn't exist, and um, it's an open box. It doesn't exist in cratonic roots. Everything that we ha in, have in cratonic roots has been depleted to some degree. Um, that's the depletion vector. But then there's been an addition, and one of the additions is megacrysts. They are they point backwards to a fertile uh, a fertile um, assemblage that has been added basically to the base of the lithosphere. I hope that um, that answers your question. That's very useful. And Andy, I notice you're very quiet. Are you still in shock having seen that picture of yourself back in your 20s, was it? That's uh, no, fun, uh, John. I just pulled a bear. That's, I've, I've re <laughs> made a massive recovery. Um, <laughs> Now, I was just going to say that one of the things that would be worth looking at is the uh, Zimbabwe data. Um, Chris Smith published stuff in the, the ninth Kimberlite conference, and um, you get very, very refractory chromites and garnets from uh, Zimbabwe, and you, you look at them and you, you think you've hit the jackpot. Um, and it's, you know, they just don't support the grades you expect. Uh, Moreau is obviously a, an exception. And um, if, you, if you get south into Venetia, well, you're in, in the Limpopo belt. But uh, they, and they commented that the, the Greenland um, Kimberlites were similar. I haven't seen that data. I, I know Herman's work there. Have you got a comment on the uh, the Greenland uh, lithosphere, uh, Herman? Yeah, next talk. Oh, okay. Just one other thing, just um, uh, to have a dissident, the, the, the megachrist uh, event uh, is probably, um, if, if you believe Mercier, uh, you know, going back to the second conference, not a, a, um, something that's happening at the base of the lithosphere, but uh, around the Kimberlite magma before eruption, he said in a, 
um, a narrow zone, maybe 15 to 50 meters wide. So that's not a sort of a, an extensive um, metasomatism. It's a, it's a restricted one, but I think that might be regarded as um, a minority view of perhaps one. Yeah, I'm not going to launch into a conversation with you about megatrusts in, in, in this forum. We could do that separately. But I agree. I mean, they are very restricted. You don't find megatrusts everywhere. Um, and it's a very simple observation. You know, we focus on the megatrusts speech in particular localities where it's well developed. So it's not a it's not a universal feature, it's a localized feature. Examples of current use and interpretation of indicator mineral sets. Yes. Um, so obviously I've looked at a lot of these kind of indicator mineral data sets uh, around the world. I've spent a whole career doing that. It's kind of my specialization. And so I'd like to share with you where this, this science or this geosciences has got to um, in terms of application in the real world. Um, and we're going to look at um, Sofatok and Chitliak, and then also just do a little bit of an interpretation on Angola. So on the top left of this front piece there, this is a, a, a plot, a pressure and temperature plot, a clinoparoxine thermobarometry with uh, black data points for Sofatok, that's in Greenland. We'll talk about uh, Greenland for a moment. Just notice here, very cold geotherm very well constrained. And the right hand diagram over here, this is a, this is a map plot of um, the Chitliak province um, interpretations in terms of uh, little pie diagrams, I call them beach balls. And we'll do look at that from Chitliak. So the question is, what is Chuck Fickey doing in the middle of uh, this diagram over here? Um, the reason Chuck Fipke features is because of the background in this image. Uh, Chuck has over 25 years produced some of the most consistent, well calibrated, um, and exceptional quality microprobe data. He standardized himself um, on standards that were produced uh, by the Carnegie Institute, Washington. Uh, as the Smithsonian standards. They were well used standards uh, in the mental community and have only recently been replaced by other standards. Um, and so his calibrated setup in his lab was, was astoundingly good. And I've been working with uh, CF Minerals research data for a very long time. And it's astounding what you can do with good data. So that's why Chuck features in, in, um, in this data set, the data uh, in this picture. Um, the data from Greenland is mostly from Chuck's lab. All the data from Chidliak is from Chuck, Chuck's lab. Uh, BHP used Chuck's lab uh, uh, exclusively. Um, and then a lot of the open file data that's for the slave has come out of Chuck's lab. But there are other labs that are also had uh, additionally, additionally good uh, good microprobe data. Um, it, um, it underpins everything that we can do um, in these, uh, uh, these interpretations. Uh, for instance, uh, Dion de Brain also produced excellent data at the CGS in um, uh, off the, the microprobe in Pretoria. Um, it's a part of the, the professional practice that I've been engaged in, in my whole career is to make sure that the data that I'm using is well calibrated. Um, and so there's the subtitle here with a focus on electron microprobe data. I'm not going to be talking about uh, laser ICPMS data. Um, it's not something that I've uh, I focused on in my career. Uh, as a result, I've had the privilege of, of, of working with, as uh, John just called it, big data. There's lots of big data out there today, um, and there has been for quite a while. So let's kick off the, uh, the talk. Um, we've seen this diagram before, yesterday, in fact. 
It's the first diagram that I put all the basics out on in terms of the mantle adiabat, uh, lithospheric geotherms, the graphite diamond stability field, and the fact that there's a hot geotherm um, for these kimberlites uh, for the mantle underneath that was sampled underneath the Kuruman province. And I'm now going to bank that geotherm and do some reverse logic. If you want to find out where in this chrome calcium diagram, where all these different rock types are distributed in the mantle, you have to have a geotherm. Once you have a geotherm and you have temperatures for individual grains, whoops, like these hard spaghetti grains, these ones, these G10 grains over here, if you have their temperature, you can lo locate them on the geotherm and in the stratigraphy. So we know that in, in the Kuruman province, these Hartsburgites appear to be restricted to this, um, to this interval in the lithospheric section. And if we do the same thing for these open circles over here, take their temperature distribution, which is this, this temperature distribution all the way over there, you'll see that that section has lurzuli uh, throughout its entire length. And we then track down these orthopyroxene eclodites, which are very unusual rocks. Uh, they are the open squares. Oops. Their distribution is a little bit shallower in the mantle. And so you can build up a picture of the lithospheric stratigraphy, if you want, or uh, other people call it the lithospheric architecture. But it's a section um, in terms of pressure that you derive from the fact that you can get a temperature out of the garnet grain. So we're answering this question, what is located where in the mantle section, i.e. the mantle stratigraphy, or, this is, the, this is a very interesting or, what and how much has been sampled by a kimberlite from a given mantle section. And as we will see, this becomes quite an important question because that variability is astounding. So there are many thermometry techniques that we can use to get a temperature from a grain. Um, you can use nickel thermometry for garnets. You can use zinc thermometry for chromites. I'll be using manganese thermometry for garnets exclusively in the rest of this talk. Obviously, you can get a temperature from chrome dioxide. You can even use temperatures from orthopyroxenes. And if you wanted to, you can go to calcium and aluminum and olivine. But for that, you have to have uh, laser ICPMS data, which I'm not going to discuss at all. That's a whole other story. So there's a lot of tools in the toolbox these days, and you have to pick your poison. My poison is manganese thermometry uh, for garnets, um, and that underpins a lot of what you'll see in the, in the next couple of slides. Let's start with uh, Greenland. Here is the clinopyroxene, uh, 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 clinopyroxene pressure temperature plot for Greenland uh, in the framework that I explained a little bit earlier. Uh, where that's a hotter geotherm, that's an intermediate geotherm, and in blue in the background is the cold geotherm for the slave. Um, the results from the Sofatok area in Greenland, which are about 550 million year old kimberlites, mostly dikes, um, uh, constrains a geotherm that is marginally colder than the slave. You can see in the gray there, interpreted in, in gray over there. It extends up to the A diabat and not beyond. And you can divide it into three temperature groups based on the manganese content in the garnet. So I've just for simplicity colored garnets that give temperatures less than 900 degrees centigrade. So that's mostly in the graphite stability field. You can see there the temperature on this geotherm less than 900 degrees centigrade is in that part of the spectrum over there. Let me get my pointer going again. Less 900 degrees centigrade. This part of the geotherm is in the graphite stability field. We color that yellow. 
Then I've divided the rest of the section into two segments in blue, 900 to 1100 degrees centigrade, uh, and from 1100 up to the adiabat, uh, that's, uh, that's colored in red, just to give you the highest temperature. So this is a temperature scale, um, lower colors, yellow, intermediate colors, uh, blue, and then the hottest parts are red. Notice here that I've, I've, I've chosen very large temperature intervals. That's 200 degrees centigrade wide. This one is wider than 200, 200 degrees centigrade. And the reason for that is the manganese thermometer has a one sigma error of plus or minus 90 degrees centigrade. So the bins are at least one sigma error bar wide. Um, and the reason for doing that is to make sure that you are not mixing noise with the signal that you're trying to track. So I'm trying to control the signal to noise ratio and that's deliberate. Uh, if I wanted to, I could make these bins much smaller, but then I will increase the noise ratio because I'm not taking care of the intrinsic error of the technique. So on open file, we had uh, 433 clinopyroxene data and an astounding amount of chrome pyro. And so this is often the case. You often see a lot more data for, for chrome pyrops um, and then accessing that data through the manganese thermometry um, then gives you a statistical leverage on your data set. So what do you see when you apply these manganese thermometry data in a map plan. This is the picture that uh, we published in 2009. Um, we took these three bins that you see over here in different temperature, de temperature bins and expressed them as a pie diagram for the amount of garnets that come from a single sample position. So this sample over here, there's a lot of garnets in it. In fact, it's about 150 garnets recovered from that one sample over there. Um, and as you go through the data set, certain samples have much less um, and other samples are richer in, 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 in the amount of garnets recovered per sample. But when you look through this image, you start seeing beach balls, as I call them. This looks like a beach ball diagram over here you see beach balls that are colored in different colors. For instance, this beach ball over here did not represent sampling in the graphite stability field. It's got no yellow in it. Uh, on the other hand, over here, there's one that has sampled predominantly in the graphite stability field and, and did not sample in, in, the deep, in the deep part of the mantle for some reason, but that's just the way it is. And so you can go from one sample to the next and start figuring out which part of the mantle is actually represented in the sample that I've taken at surface. When you do that for this data set, it becomes quite obvious that if you're looking for diamond, for the highest proportion of material that comes out of the diamond stability field, then you just start looking for the red and the, uh, the red and the blue. Uh, pi diagrams, which is over here and over there. Um, and they're over there and there and there. But once you move away from this, this, this part of the, the, the section over there, you start seeing a lot more yellow. And in particular, in this part of the, uh, so the, the, the map, there's, there's very little red and there's quite a bit of yellow sitting up here. So if you, had to, um, if you had to go and sample somewhere or go and follow up somewhere, your first point of focus would be uh, sort of in this area over here. And then also this little area over here where there's two, two samples that have a high proportion of sampling in the diamond stability field. And that's what um, um, Hudson Resources, um, uh, the CEO of Hudson Resources at that time was uh, James Tour. Um, he then took this open file data set, uh, gave it to me and said, uh, do your magic and uh, tell me where to go. So he went over here to a place called, that was subsequently named Garnet Lake, 
They found a little lake there. The lake shore had lots of garnets in it. Uh, it was like Exeter Lake in, in, in the slave craton. Um, and they then found kimberlite dikes. And I sampled the kimberlite dikes for microdiamonds. And that's what they found. Um, they found kimberlite dikes in situ with microdiamonds in them, 108 kilos, a fairly flat microdiamond curve, and ultimately ended up pursuing a, a dike setting there called Garnet Lake. The grades weren't fantastic. They were about uh, 20 carats per 100 tons. Um, but they very quickly focused on you know, their target area over here. They also followed up stuff over there in the, uh, afterwards. Wasn't that encouraging, it did have diamonds. Uh, they didn't spend a lot of time up here. But one of the things that you can start seeing from the variation of, of this data set is that when you start mixing these kind of garnet uh, thermal profiles, if you can call that, these are beach balls are basically represent thermal profiles. If you take these garnets, you erode them down into this stream bed and you mix them with these garnets over here, you end up with beach balls that are very well sorted and they all look quite similar. Um, in fact, Chuck Fipke's company took all these samples. They were all analyzed at Chuck Fipke's lab. And so this gives you an indication of how you start mixing different populations together and blending them uh, in the secondary environment that is of interest to people like Mike DeVitt and so on. Uh, how do these indicators then get transported um, and out into um, sediments that are collecting uh, in this fjord over there? So that's an interesting aside. Uh, I was actually quite surprised to be able to resolve this, um, you know, this kind of picture uh, at, at Safartok. And I became interested in, well, what is the fine structure in this, um, in this data set? And that's what I'll talk about next. Just please forget that the, the background is in this image. Uh, that was a mistake that was made early on in the drafting. Um, just remember that this, this cloud of beach balls that you see over here are spatially correct. They're not in their correct location but they are spatially, the spatial topology is correct. So what I became interested in is um, these high count uh, portion of the data set. I just want to change something over here. There we go. Um, the high count portion of the data set larger than four garnets recovered per sample was 30% of the data set. And I was interested to see, well, what do you see in the high count portion of the data set? If you had to select high interest areas out of this data set, what do you find? Um, and what you find is highlighted in white, um, areas where there's predominantly red or blue and little yellow. Those are areas of interest because they give you um, a signal that comes out of the diamond stability field. Um, and you would highlight those kind of areas um, highlighted in, in white over there. So those are areas of interest. And there are six distinct districts, one, two, three, four, five, six, and a couple of isolated samples that we have. If you now compare that to the remainder of the data set where you have recovered less than or equal to three pyros per sample, which is the dominant proportion of this data set. There's a lot of low count data across this whole data set. Um, and it, you know, it's 70% of your data set. Then those are the same white areas that have been highlighted over there. And if you go into these data points over here, you'll see there's a little area of interest over there. There's another area of interest over there. And you start highlighting the same areas as before, but in addition, other areas like this one. 
that's a high interest portion of the data set. It's represented by one sample on the left hand side, but represented by a lot of low count samples on the right hand side. And similarly, you can, you know, you can go through this data set. I was absolutely astonished to be able to get this type of reproduction uh, of areas of interest with the low count uh, portion of the data set. So this is big data at a low count rate. Um, and yeah, I was, I, was, I was blown away by the fact that you were able to do that because it gave you uh, a representation or at very high fidelity, um, even at very low count rates. Um, so that's of scientific interest, but it's also of interest in terms of exploration. Uh, every grain actually matters. So I think that's all I'm gonna say about Safar Talk. Uh, that was my first experience of trying to um, uh, interpret things at a grain by grain scale uh, using manganese thermometry. And it was highly successful as far as I was concerned. Um, we can now look at the chrome calcium diagram. We'll move away from temperatures. Um, this is the diagram that I think uh, Andy Moore was interested in seeing. It's a fairly unusual chrome calcium diagram. Comes from an open file data set. There's where you can find and reproduce this, these data set. There's 500, 5,000, almost 6,000 garnered data points over here. Uh, Andy, you'll notice uh, there's depleted Hartsbergite. It goes all the way up to almost zero calcium. These would be dunites. Um, uh, they have an interesting disposition relative to this line that we, uh, that we now have added to the chrome calcium diagram over there. And when you go above that line, when you're in the diamond stability field guaranteed on a cold geotherm, uh, the signal of Hartsbergite looks entirely different. Um, we can resolve that because we now have temperatures for each of these grains using the, the manganese thermometry. Um, and when we do that, using the calcium intercept projection, which I uh, explained yesterday, we get the picture on the right hand side. Here's the diamond stability field. It starts at about 900 degrees centigrade and it extends to depth in the subcalcic part of the spectrum. So there are definitely Hartsburgeric garnets um, sitting in the diamond stability field, and that's where your diamond potential would be. Most of those are these kind of compositions, and there are some of these that are those compositions over there. But down here at low temperatures, and in fact, very low temperatures, all the way down to 600 degrees centigrade roughly, is this material over here. This is very depleted Hartsburgite, and it's sitting in the graphite stability field. Um, and it's something that we are not used to in the Cobval Craton. This does not occur to any extent in the Cobval Craton. The Cobval Craton does not have depleted material sitting in the graphite stability field to the extent that you can see in Greenland or in the slave. We have the same situation sitting in the slave. Um, I think that's all I needed to say about the Sephardic garnet compositions. So here's a summary. Clinoparoxine and garnet are well preserved in a cold climate. That helps. Um, these new age pressure temperature techniques are easily applied if you have high quality probe data, and we do. The clinoparoxine geotherm is quite cold. The diamond window is about 900 degrees centigrade. We have about 6,000 garnets and 1,500 samples are sufficient to pinpoint the diamond potential across the property. It's like a first phase follow up data set. Um, manganese thermometry applied to these garnet G9 and the G10 garnet compositions. Uh, it's the G9 garnet compositions that probably there's lots of them. It's their thermometry that supports the beach ball, beach ball interpretations that I showed you in the previous slides. And so that gives you the statistical leverage. It's sense checked 
There's a high, high fidelity uh, manganese thermometry outcomes because of the, the low count rate signal that you can recover. Make sure that you check your one sigma error. Uh, if, you, if you don't keep that in mind, you will start mixing your signal with your noise um, and you won't get these high fidelity outcomes. There's a very high proportion of G10 garnets. Look at the signal up here. Most of them are graphite facies on the cold geothermal. And there has been substantial shallow mantle sampling at temperatures less than 900 degrees centigrade. The diamond potential is related to the deep mantle sampling of G10D grains, these, these ones over there. Um, and the micro diamond results reflect the highly variable diamond potential. So that's something that John Gurney teaches everybody or used to teach everybody. Uh, indicator mineral chemistry needs to be sense checked against the actual diamond result. These days, we use micro diamonds for that purpose. We're gonna move on to Chitliac. Um, I'm not going to be concerned with all of these technical details, so I'll just cover them off very quickly. I just have to point out, this is all published. There are three publications from 2012 up to uh, 2018 that records the evolution of stuff that we did at the Chiliac project. Um, the Chiliac project occurs in Baffin Island in Canada. Uh, I was involved with this project by way of Peregrine Diamonds where I was the VP exploration. And so we had a field day in terms of ap applying these techniques. Here's a chrome calcium plot for, um, uh, for Chiliac as published in 2012. Um, there's some ecligaric garnets, there's high sodium, uh, ecligaric garnet compositions over here. It turns out many of the diamonds from Chidiac are, are ecligaric. Um, and this signal um, is an important signal to keep track of at Chidiac. Um, we've, we've managed to constrain a very, very cold geothermal. Look at this. It's colder than the slave craton. And it has a kink at high temperatures, um, which is another part of the story that I don't need to discuss at this point. So I will leave that part of the story alone and go look at the manganese and titanium uh, uh, outcomes. Uh, in other words, the beach balls that we were able to construct for Chediac. Before we go there, we did a little modification to the manganese thermometry or the beach ball um, uh, representation. Basically, we added one high titanium class. So the same temperature classes based on manganese thermometry, yellow, blue, and red, uh, the same temperature brackets. We've just added a black, um, a, a high titanium category, um, uh, just as a black sector in the, in the beach ball. Um, these were some of the first in, uh, outcomes that we got at Chibliac that were of interest. So there are known discovered kimberlites. Their beach balls are shown in um, uh, these squares over here. So this kimberlite, the set of kimberlites over here have a very unique beach ball pattern. It's mostly low temperature. Uh, these two kimberlites that are actually underneath a lake, very difficult to get at. Um, they have a completely different beach ball pattern. And indicator minerals that then are down ice, distributed down ice from these sources, they follow the beach ball patterns of the source. And so you can start uh, figuring out what your source looks like from data that is you know, a couple of kilometers away in the Canadian Arctic setting, uh, provided you know which way these indicators have come from the source, and in this case, it's very obvious. Um, it's it's uh, the down ice direction is towards the northeast. Um, these beach balls clearly belong to these sources over here, and they didn't go up uphill and much further down here. There's very thin little signal of them uh, going that way, um, but we can attribute this population to these sources over here. And what they see of the mantle is completely different from what these Kimberlites see of the mantle. So we uh, developed that, uh, that concept a little further. 
uh, right in the central portion of, of the Chitliak province. We have lots and lots of garnet data. Um, I'll just uh, point out here in these square boxes, um, as published in 2018, um, this is the beach ball signal you get from a kimberlite called CH1. It's actually off the picture on the north over here. Uh, CH7 has two different phases in it. They've seen slightly different versions of the mantle. CH7 is located over there. Um, CH45 is located over there. Um, it has a different uh, beach ball pattern to CH44, which is located over there. Um, and then there are also a CH8 located over there and CH46. The reason they've got orange circles around them is these two kimberlites don't contribute. They don't actually, if you do the beach ball pattern or you try to do the beach ball pattern out of them, uh, you don't get much out of them because they don't have a lot of garnets in the kimberlite themselves. So the quantity of garnets that are in individual sources um, also changes. It's one of the things that changes in this data set. Obviously at CH7, we've got enough, CH45 and so on. And so if we interpret the beach ball pattern that's, um, that's represented over here, notice the scale, that's one kilometer. These kimberlites are less than a kilometer apart. That one's about one and a half kilometers away from that one. That's about you know a kilometer over there, maybe two kilometers over there. You can interpret this at a very close uh, close range interpretation. Uh, there's CH62 over here. It has distributed a high count uh, garnet data set. The beach balls are quite large, mostly from the graphite stability field, um, and it's gone downhill all the way down here. The glaciers basically flowed downhill and put a wash of yellow color all the way across these sources over here and even into there. All of this is attributed to a single source that is highly prolific in terms of the amount of garnets it pushes out into the secondary uh, environment. To the extent that the signal that you see from CH44, which is over here, that signal actually gets obliterated by the extra yellow that's been added. And it's only when you go down in this part of the sector over here that you start reproducing the signal that is from CH44. Um, and we can do similar interpretations for, for the garnets that are shedding out of CH7. We know what the source looks like. Um, these patterns over here are very similar to that pattern over there. That's from CH7. This one has an additional um, yellow and black from sources that are yet to be determined. Uh, are they likely related to what's coming out of this part of the spectrum and off the diagram over here. And then there's a whole slew of garnets sitting over here. Um, many of which have a similar signal or beach ball imprint um, and likely represent a mixture of all the garnets that are coming from all the different kimberlites over here um, and were pushed to the west of this image by the glaciation uh, that occurred in this topographic uh, area over here. So it becomes quite a complex picture. Um, but it's amazing that we can actually resolve this type of um, mixing of different garnet populations at this scale using just normal exploration data and, and good quality probe data. I don't think there's much more I need to add about Chitliak. Um, we did a statistical study on this data set just because it, you know, it became quite difficult to, to, manual, to do manual interpretation of the mixing of all the different components that are represented in this image. And as a result of that statistical uh, study, um, we ended up with this conclusion, temperature titanium attributes of Chidliac uh, peridotic garnet populations can be resolved at larger than equal of 4% relative difference. 
using multivariate statistical techniques. Uh, and the one we used in that talk was called Mahalanobis distance. Um, um, I was absolutely blown away by the fact that we could see differences of less, you know, of about 4%. Um, we see variable depth entrainment of the ambient periodic mantle uh, for neighboring kimberlites. I think that point was very well made uh, by looking uh, at this previous image. This is also known from global nickel thermometry data set, though it's often poorly appreciated at a local scale. Um, we can fingerprint individual pipes using this technique. Uh, and there's an implication that we can see all this variability from one kimberlite to the next, which is this. Proto-kimberlite melts precondition and materially modify the melt migration channel ways along individual ascent paths. Uh, you can also call it a conduit. This is basically the same statement as was made by Debbie uh, Bowen and John Ward for Carl. Uh, based on their K6LQGKFK K12 differentiation, but they did the differentiation in a different manner. They basically used distinctive diamond population. I'm just using distinctive garnet populations, but it's the same story. At Chidliak, it turns out the deeper one third of the lithosphere is affected uh, by this, by this protokimbalite melt uh, uh, pathway as witnessed by polymic pyridotites and uh, uh, Andy would be uh, pleased to know, partial megacrist suites. We see partial developments of megacrist suites along different uh, melt channel ways. Um, and there's the evidence. Here's a melt veined garnet CPX dunite. Uh, there are the little proto kimberlite melts sitting on grain boundaries. Um, and if you start looking at the indicator minerals that are associated with these melt migration pathways, that's a megacrystic clinopyroxene, that's a megacrystic uh, ilmenite. Here's a similar rock type, um, it's a clinopyroxene dunite, it's ilmenite veined. Uh, this is all related to this proto kimberlite melt that's, um, that's ascending through the lithosphere at a very local scale. This was one of the first images that I put up um, when we started this lecture series. It's a, it's a cross section uh, at a grand scale across a craton or a conceptual craton as, uh, as, as portrayed by Maggie Lobsher on commission from De Beers. Um, I just want to revisit basically what I've just said, what I said earlier, um, individual kimberlites ascend or individual melt ascend from the interface of the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary in an off craton setting that's in the graphite stability field and is of less interest to us. I also pointed out uh, different ascent paths for different melts from inside the diamond stability field and the fact that you can sample the lower crust uh, in that process. What I've just shown you is the evidence for this kind of process um, individual melts sample different portion of the diamond facies. You represent that by different beach ball patterns. Here's an example also uh, from New Liskard. Look at the difference here in terms of the temperature profiles for garnet, for clinopyroxenes in this case. Uh, lots of clinopyroxene data at low temperatures. Then a dearth of information through the section over here, and then lots of clinopyroxene uh, uh, information at high temperatures, very close to the A dieback, but not above. Um, that's represented by this picture over here. This part of the signal is coming from there, and then there's nothing in between, or very little. Um, and then there's a, a pickup in, in the amount of material that's being entrained. Uh, much shallower in the graphite stability field, uh, you might as well be at a craton margin uh, in terms of the sampling pattern of the mantle that you can recover from single grains, in this case, clinopyroxene, and in the Chudliak case, um, uh, garnets. We're seeing much more of this kind of thing happening now. It's, uh, it's appearing in the published literature. 
This is a paper 2020, uh, Paulo Nimmus with, um, with a, a team of De Beers people, um, uh, Robin Preston, Samantha Perrett, Ingrid Chin, that's just appeared in, um, in Lithos. Uh, look at the numbers of data. They've got 883 climate pyroxene pressures and temperatures, uh, 543 chrome pyrox. They use nickel thermometry. Uh, you see nickel thermometry data here, represented over here. Same temperature range as what you see out of the climate pyroxenes from Kimberley. Um, there's, they've got the geotherm going on in Kimberley. In that same paper, they represented um, the data set from Cullinan in South Africa. It looks completely different. Uh, some of the numbers of garnet, clinoparoxines and garnets analyzed. Look at the temperature sampling profile at Cullinan. It's completely different from Kimberley. There's a very high temperature imprint. We've seen that at Chidliak as well. Uh, the garnet thermometry gives you a very similar signal. High temperature data, uh, very little. Um, at lower temperatures. Um, and if you go to the nickel thermometry data sets that are, are now available as supplementary data sets to this publication, um, this is what is in the publication. It gives you a mantle sampling profile at a temperature, temperature distribution for Kimberley um, that has different types of garnets, including high titanium ones, Megachristic garnets, lurzolitic and Hartsburgeri garnets. This is what it looks like. Um, sampling in the diamond stability field. If you turn that into a beach ball, the beach ball would look like this. This is the data set from Cullinan on public, uh, on public file now. Look at the proportion of high titanium material that they see over here. Megachrists over there all of which are high temperature, high, high temperature. This is in fact, the dominant portion of their high temperature uh, imprint. If you turn that into a beach ball, that's what it would look like. This beach ball is completely different from that beach ball over there. Um, we're getting down to very fine details with these techniques that are available to us. I just want to emphasize, if you want temperatures from garnets, you can use nickel thermometry as was the case for this data set. If you only have uh, microprobe data, you can use um, manganese thermometry. Uh, I'm using an unpub unpublished version of the manganese thermometer. I'm still working on, publicate, on publishing that, um, but Creighton has a published version that you could also use. So that brings us to a little, uh, little bit of commentary on Angola. I've been working on Angolan data sets for a while. Many of them are not in the public domain. Um, I won't be talking about stuff that's not in the public domain. Confidential stuff stays confidential. However, what is in the public domain is worth talking about. So one of the things that I put in the public domain was a CPX data set, uh, 247 data points from the Lashinga Kimberlites. Where is that? The Lashinga Kimberlites are basically where you see Altoquilo 63. That's over there. Uh, it's about 120 kilometers southwest of Kotoka. And what we see in this uh, clinopyroxene data set from Lashinga uh, is a cold geotherm with a high temperature inflection, roughly at graphite diamond. Uh, lots of sampling in the graphite stability field uh, and some sampling in the diamond stability field over here at high temperatures. No, none of these temperatures are above the A-direct. Just want to make that point again. So what we see from Lashinga, about 140 million years old, those Kimberlites, normal cool geotherm, quite consistent with what you would expect from the fact that there are diamonds at Katoka and many other Kimberlites in Angola. It basically implies that as a normal or you know, a typical cratonic geotherm. However, some time ago now, Joe Boy and Bobby Danchen, both of whom are not with us anymore, published a paper in the American Journal of Science where they described garnet lurzolites from a kimberlite called Summer Ponza. So Kwanzaa is sitting down here. 
in the central portion of Angola. And to my astonishment, if you take their data, and you put it on the pyroxene, the clinopyroxene diagram, you see a very hot, effectively off craton geotherm at Soma Kwanzaa. So my Kwanzaa is dated at 134 million years. And just to make sure that this was not a flash in the pan, I also plotted it on the orthopyroxene diagram, which we can use for the same purpose, guess where it plots, very hot geothermal. So there is at roughly the same age um, across Angola, there, is, uh, there are different geotherms represented. Uh, in the pub, on pub, based on public domain information. And I was surprised to find that Soma Kwanzaa has as hot a geotherm um, as, as portrayed uh, in these diagrams over here. Um, it is unusually hot. It has to mean that there has been a rifting event of some nature, and it's represented in this part of the Angolan. Uh, setting at this age. So I think the other thing that we can see from Angola is we can see Ghana data sets uh, very early on, 1992, a Russian guy put out 25 data points for Kamafuka, Kamazamba. So where is Kamafuka? Kamafuka is on this diagram over here. It's a little bit west of, of, of Kamutwe um, and a little bit south. So it's between Katoka and Kamutwe uh, on the western side, roughly over there. Um, and I looked at this data set for a long time before I started believing that it's real. Um, the pressure that you would get out of that composition over there is the minimum pressure. And it's larger than 59 kilobars. It tells you there's some very deep mantle around at Kamafuka. Um, if you don't believe that pressure, well, this one would be about 55. Um, and then there are also loads of little corners over there, as, as is expected. Um, it took a long time to have that pressure reconfirmed. And the people who reconfirmed them was De Beers. They, in 2012, they published a very good paper about uh, their exploration findings in central Angola in the B province. And they had two Kimberlite clusters there uh, on the Lubia property. The Lubia cluster, it's in the northwest of that property. It's in uh, uh, this part of Angola over here. Very big data set, 17,000 data points on this one graph. There's a 60 kilobar grain. We've seen this data set before. We've discussed it before. We've said, um, it would be associated with deep lithosphere. It's likely not an Archean lithosphere. It's a Proterozoic lithosphere. This is where it comes from. Uh, it looks like there's a Proterozoic lithosphere sitting underneath this part of the Angolan crater. In addition, in this paper, they described seven pipes, which are slightly different in their setting on the same property. Um, these pipes, have sampled the same lithosphere, but in a completely different manner. And so the signal that you recover from this lithosphere by way of these pipes, it's a little subcluster, looks completely different just because of the sampling pattern of the mantle. Now the data is actually not with this, um, with this uh, data set. Um, only the chrome calcium plots were, di uh, were, were published, but just from the chrome calcium plots, you can already make the distinction that these kimberlites uh, in the same property, we assume they're the same age or similar age, they have sampled the existing mantle that's there in a completely different fashion, and that has changed the view of their prospectivity relative to these kimberlites over here. Uh, by the way, they did, uh, De Beers did follow up 14 of these 37 pipes in this cluster uh, with microdiamond sampling and 12 of the 14 have microdiamonds in them. 
Um, but the indications were that these were low-grade kimberlites and uh, the beers let them go. So how deep is the subcontinental lithospheric mantle in Angola? Well, it goes up to at 60 kilobars. It might go a little bit deeper than that. What is the nature of that mantle? Well, it doesn't look like it's Archean. Is it being sampled in, by, in, in a different manner by different generations of kimberlite? For sure, you can't... Uh, that's the explanation for the difference between these two plots that you see over here. So there's not much more to add um, because there isn't a lot more uh, uh, that's available in, pub in, in, in the public domain. I've compiled from lots of, lots of different sources this, uh, this, this data set. These are some of the sources that are, that are uh, disclosed over here. Uh, the public data set is now strong, nearly 2,000, uh, 3,000. Um, uh, it includes uh, data from Katoka, which I've just, uh, there are two data sets from Katoka, um, which are transposed on top of the Lubia data set just to see um, what the comparison might be. Um, and it looks like the Lubia data set in the background over here is not too dissimilar to what people are getting out of Katoka. So potentially the type of mantle that we see in, you know, in this chrome calcium diagram over here, extends all the way through there and it's sitting underneath Katoka. Uh, it may well be sitting underneath Kamafuka and all the way up to Kamutwe. There's some Kamutwe data in here as well. Um, so there you have it. That's what we can say about Angola. Um, do we want bigger, uh, higher pressures than 60 kilobars? No, that's deep enough. Uh, are we going to see lots of periodic G10 garnets um, in the Angolan setting? No, I don't think we are. Um, so we are not looking at a carp vol or a Zimbabwe craton analog. This is a different beast. Um, and in this beast's setup, Eclogeric diamonds will count. I'm waiting for the day that somebody puts out a diamond inclusion data set for Angolan diamonds that has not yet happened, but I'm expecting to see a lot of Eclogeric diamonds in Angola. So here's some conclusions. If you apply this thermal barometry in diamond exploration, um, we've seen these conclusions before. We've seen all these applications. Today we've discussed Sufata Chidliak, Kimberley Premier, and we had a preliminary look at the indicator chemistry for Angola. Uh, I think the point to make here is microprobe data are affordable and you can usefully apply them. Uh, single CPX geothermal barometry is here to stay, as is pyroxenocrust thermometry. And with that, I'll open the floor to comments or questions. Thanks, Herman. Very interesting. I don't see any um, questions on the on the chat yet. And Herman, I mean, looking at, at Angola, you've obviously done some work there and going back to the work done at Altaquila. I mean, when you did find diamonds, um, did you get any, any sort of sense of the inclusion characteristics from those diamonds? Yeah, well, look, um, people simply don't <laughs> Diamonds are a commercial uh, venture in Angola. Yeah, sure. Uh, right now, you know, the, the level of sort of research or, or you know, that capability is something that they're, they're, the people aren't even interested. Um, I'll be talking to, uh, particularly with a new diamond hub that's in, Sor in Sorina, so with the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. There are going to be off cuts from diamonds, and the thing yeah. that they cut out are the inclusions. And I'm going to see if I can start something um, on that front over there. Yeah, we need to go and have a chat to Jacinto Rocha and, and you know, impress upon him that we need some, some good research data out of Angola. Maybe he's got influence. Yeah, there are other people we can talk to as well. <laughs> Or particularly your old colleague, your old colleague like um, you know De Beers and Ken Tainton at Rio. Now look, we just we need to we need to go and speak to the cutters. Yeah. 
the, in, the people who do all the brooding, the serenes um, uh, of this world, they cut out all the pieces that are not of interest and uh, you can give them, you know, $20 a carat for that stuff and that, that makes good, uh, good research material. <laughs> good, good point. Um, the, the line of Kimberlites in, in Angola is broadly parallel to the one in southern Africa that goes through Botswana. Um, and th there seems to be a little bit of a time sequence in, in, the, in the South African Botswana line, but uh, not so much in, in Angola, or um, do you just not have enough dates for that? Yeah, look, so it's, uh, the, the, it's the latter case, and the um, dating of Angolan Kimberlites in, in its infancy. Um, while I was with um, um, the Altaquila project, I, um, I got into dating. You know I do dating of Kimberlites. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of that. Um, I got into the dating of the Kimberlites. That was published in that paper on the Lushinga, uh, Lushinga Kimberlites, those dates. At the time, we collected more age dates than the rest of Angola combined. And we only published about seven or eight of them. But the interesting thing is uh, on that Altaquila property, we have ages that go from 145 million years to about 108. So that's actually quite a big range. We have Kimberlites erupted in one place spanning 145 to about 108 million years. Were those zircon uh, ages, um, or, or what were you dating, Herman? Yeah, uh, Andy, uh, dating Angolan Kimberlites because they are so altered is a whole nother ball game. You won't believe how much trouble I had to go to to, um, to get perovskite ages. So some of them are perovskite ages. There is one zircon age, um, um, and it's published in that paper. Um, and we actually squeezed mica ages out, I think. Or did we ultimately, no, we, we, got, we got some mica ages, um, um, RBSR. It took an insane amount of effort to get fresh, uh, fresh flock of yeah. Just a point of clarity, the Richard Horn's asking about the naming in the chat box. So. Oh, let me just uh, see the chat. <coughs> Sorry, I can't, uh, I don't seem to see that question. Now the question is, is it uh, Luashi or Lushinga? And, and those ah. are two Kimberlites. Uh, Luashi ah. is the new one um, that's yes. reported by Al Rosa. And, but you're talking about one that was discovered previously in a different place. Yeah. 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 So yeah, let's just uh, clear that up for, for Richard. Um, go back here. So Luashi, it's just uh, it's about 12 kilometers southwest of Katoka. That's the new one that Oros was talking about. It's the new development uh, in, in Angola. Uh, the Lushinga Kimberlites are on the Altaquilo property. Um, and they're about 40 or so kilometers southwest of Luashi. Um, they are not anything like um, uh, Luashi. They're a little subcluster of Kimberlites on the Altaquila property, um, and they have their own characteristics. And, and there's many of them, Herman. I mean, lots of Kimberlites as you go out east there. Jeez, hmm? John, you have <laughs> John. There's a career. There's a career for people who are interested in Kimberlites in Angola. I'm counting career Kimberlites in Angola. Yeah, I, um, I know of at least a thousand Kimberlites in Angola based yeah. on geophysical images. Okay, um, uh, thanks everybody. I'm uh, changing gears now from the indicators and now actually starting to look at diamonds these days. Uh, it's, a new it's a new venture on my part. Um, and it starts a little while back. Uh, in November 21, I gave a talk for what's called the Vancouver Kimberlite Cluster. Uh, John Bristow had a look at that talk. And during that talk, I looked at the diamond data, in fact, the microdiamond data from uh, a Kimberlite called Tuawi, 
which is north, in northeastern Canada. Um, and for the benefit of discussion that Andy Moore started yesterday, um, I've just put up the three bullet points here that come out of that talk, um, which is that um, small diamond zenith nuggets uh, are diluted in barren kimberlite in this setting over here. Um, and it, it, it forces us to recognize that there are two distinct diamond populations after dilution and mixing, which requires you to use two grade size curves uh, in the microdiamond population. And how that differs from, from current application is that current benchmarks implicitly assume homogeneous mixtures described by a single grade size curve. So the way that I'm starting to look at microdiamond populations is not really driven by geostatistical considerations, although I'm going to talk about that in this talk. It's driven by sort of petrological considerations, which is the field that I come from. So I might have a slightly different perspective on, on you know, how diamonds that are contained in mantle rocks end up mixed with kimberlite and how we then analyze those things um, and try to derive a, a geostatistical um, description of that process. Um, and can I just ask a question there? Sorry to butt in, but I think it's important now. Yeah. When you say small diamond xenolith nuggets, so that's, that's small xenoliths. Yes. Okay. Yes. Not necessarily so, small diamonds. Yes. So it's a good question to ask at this point. So that's why I want to, you know, I just wanted to put this up at the front end here. The Tawawi case makes, makes us, it forces us to recognize that a small pyridotite like this, which comes from Udachnaya, has an astounding number of, of very small diamonds, but has no macrograde attached to it. In this case, for this diamond ectoglide, it's a very small xenolith. You can see there's one centimeter over there. That's five millimeters up there. Um, this particular fragment of the mantle is an ectoglide. It has 30 diamonds in it in a completely different size range. 0 0.8 to 3.4 millimeters. Those are slightly commercial diamonds and the macro grade of this thing is, is enormous. If you take these two fragments of the mantle, which both contain diamonds and you start mixing them, and in fact, you dilute them in kimberlite, in barren kimberlite, then you can end up explaining the type of micro diamond distributions that you see at Tuwawi. Um, and so from a statistical point of view, these diamond bearing pieces of rock are nuggets. And from a petrological point of view, they are small diamonds in mass. I hope that clarifies uh, just these four, these four words that are, that are over there. So let's start the talk um, by just pointing out that I have previously spoken fairly recently uh, about this topic, uh, in particular March 2019 when uh, COVID uh, came around to, to Canada at PDAC. Um, I gave this talk um, and so it's pretty much forgotten in the fog of the past two years. Um, and we spoke about uh, micro macro diamond benchmarks, precisions and errors and examples several of which are repeated in the current talk today. But I wanted to put up this graph that came from that talk. Um, and it is, it's, a, it's an important graph to bear in mind when you, when you start talking about microdiamonds. Um, in, uh, in, in 2001, uh, National Instrument 43101 in Canada, version one of that instrument uh, became came into effect as a result of the Briax gold scan, which was perpetrated by way of the Vancouver Stock Exchange at that point in time. And what NI43101 caused is a set of disclosure uh, related in particular to the junior mining industry 
um, but it has now crept up uh, in brackets to sort of mid-tier producers as well. Fairly soon after that, the, Can uh, the Canadian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy instituted this thing called Route 2 sieve reporting for microdiamond results um, and standardized the way um, diamond, junior diamond explorers were to report their microdiamond results because microdiamond results are considered material information. And so as a result of these two events, um, the amount of microdiamond data that was being disclosed in the public domain, in a standardized format, root to sieve format, um, it just skyrocketed. Um, uh, it it took a it took a dive after the, the financial crisis. So in the post GFC period, um, it became uh, much lower. Um, but uh, since then, it's picked up again. Uh, in addition, as you can see in the brown. Uh, the brown bar graphs here, the public bulk sampling results, which were reported in DTC sieves and, and by ton, um, has become disclosed as a result of NI43101. And you'll see the shape of this curve is roughly the same as the shape of this curve, but uh, it's displaced two or three years later. And that's the exploration cycle. You first get your microdiamond results, and then you follow the follow up the ones that are of interest. Um, and these two data sets combined, microdiamonds, and the bulk sampling result that goes with a set of three year earlier microdiamond results, um, it becomes a, um, a data set that you can recompile and then make these micro macro diamond benchmarks out of them which is something that I then went into and started looking at precision and errors that's related to combining these two data sets and making benchmarks out of them. The other talk, as I just alluded to, was uh, 2nd of November, 2021. Uh, it has a lot more to do with what we see in terms of microdiamond distributions uh, at low counts because at low counts, you start seeing uh, nuggets much easier. And as a result, you start you being forced to consider the contribution of geostatistical nuggets to the total um, uh, microdiamond content from particular kimberlites and into Huawei that takes on a whole new meaning. That talk is actually recorded. It's on YouTube, so I'm not going to spend any time uh, on that. Uh, the focus for today's talks uh, just this one single talk is just these four topics over here. I'll put in some context, which comes from uh, a Journal of South African Institute of Mining and Metallurgy uh, publication, 1973, Herbert Seschel. I'll rapidly move on to Debbie Bowen's disclosure around the Tseng Terai in Lithos, and then we'll look at the stuff uh, that was discussed at, at PDAC um, uh, in 2019. There is bonus for those people who uh, whose brains aren't fried by the end of this, and we'll 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 do a straw poll uh, at the end of this talk to see whether we want to cover that. So let's get going. This looks like a lot to consume uh, in the first slide, but it's the only slide I'll show about that paper. Um, this is a very important paper to go and look at if you're interested in microdiamond or in fact diamond uh, uh, size distributions, it's publicly available. It was written by Herbert Sichel, who was a geostatistician at Wits University. And it was written on commission of Anglo-American. Um, and the acknowledgement is in this paper. I just didn't copy it out. Herbert Sichel was a colleague of a guy called Dani Kricher, and Dani Kricher is the, um, the godfather of a technique called Krieging. Um, the two of them together were a powerful force in geostatistics at Wits uh, in the early 70s. Um, so good pedigree, South African. Um, and it's useful to start reading just this, um, uh, 
paragraphs on the left, how do you eat an elephant is one bite at a time. So let's go through this slide uh, one bite at a time with the aid of a laser pointer. Let's look at this first paragraph over here. The cumulative percentage frequency distribution of stone sizes as given in table three for block X, that's the D beach, we're talking about alluvial diamond size frequency distributions here is plotted on a logarithmic probability paper in a paper written by a guy called Timus Wisterfeld, 1972. So this is the context for the current paper. The almost perfect straight line plot corroborates the remarks made previously that diamond sizes in marine deposits of Namibia are well represented by a two parameter log normal distribution, provided the stones originate from a small compact mining block on one and the same beach horizon. These are very important words. The two parameter log normal distribution that we often use in diamond size distributions um, has a rider on it. And the rider is that you're dealing with one population. And in this case, we're talking about alluvial diamond size distributions. Um, and we are currently applying those to kimberlites, but that's another story. So as this paper then goes further, they say that they, they bank this observation that was made earlier by Tinas Westerfeld. And they go on to their current data set that's discussed in this paper. A further interesting example is shown as curve A in figure one and in table four. So there's table four. And there's figure one. They say the 204 sizes listed are all of stones originating from a single five square meter trench section. So this data is from one locality and one very specific locality. The plot A is linear on log probability paper. And the size the, the si squared test in table four is satisfactory. There's the size squared test over there, indicating that the two parameter log normal distribution holds right down to a small and very exceptional diamond concentration. There's the data 204 stones. This is how it plots on this diagram over here. It's one population. Because it's alluvial, it's size sorted. It represents a log linear plot, that's this linear line, and represents a log normal distribution that can be described by two parameters. These are the two parameters over here. This is the standard that we use even to this day for many of the diamond size distributions that people are, are working on are log linear plots, a two parameter log normal distribution. Not that complicated, it's a straight line fit on a log log graph or a log cumulative graph. But now things take a turn. In the next paragraph, Herbert Sichel says this, in contradistinction, graph B in figure one represents the cumulative frequency distribution of 1022 stone sizes given in table five. Here they are over here. There's 1022 data points. Um, the graph in figure one is convex and curves strongly towards larger stone sizes, indicating a compound log normal distribution. That's this graph over here. In consequence thereof, equation 28 was fitted to the data, which is a compound log normal distribution. That's the equation that they fitted to the data. And the parameter estimates are given at the bottom of table five. There they are over there. The size squared test indicates a very good agreement between observations and theory. This is a four parameter compound log normal distribution. Very few people that are currently working with diamond data sets are actually fitting their data with compound log normal distributions. You need compound log normal distributions if you have more than one population. You can end up with more than one population 
if you're sampling in two different areas or if there are more than one populations in your underlying data set. Often it's sufficient to describe a curve like this with a single linear plot on log, on log, compound, uh, log cumulative frequency space and with two parameters, as is the case over here. But right in the early part of, of the development of this technology, Herbert Sichel had already seen sufficient evidence from marine diamond deposits where they're mixing different, uh, differently sorted diamond populations to introduce the compound log normal distribution. A lot of us have forgotten about the fact that this exists um, and that we have the capacity to describe multi-population diamond data sets. Um, and it's right there in a paper in 1973 that was commissioned by Anglo-America. So as a result of reading this paper and paying a little bit of attention to what, what is being said here, um, we can now go and look at one of the best um, size distribution uh, graphs that's been published of late. It's the one that comes out of the paper by Debbie, Bo Debbie Bowen and, and other authors, including John Ward. Um, it was published in 2009. Um, there is no such, there is no other size frequency distribution published uh, in the public domain like it. It is unique in the sense that Let's read the caption over here. Figure three. Diamond size frequency distribution for the main and satellite tapes and let's say total production, 200,000 carats on one graph over a period of four and a bit years of production. This is a very true representation of the diamond distribution in these exceptional kimberlites in let's say. Uh, in addition, there's a very important bit of information here. The recovered let's sing diamonds average about one carat per stone. And the important information is what the bottom cutoff is. At a two millimeter bottom cutoff, and two millimeter square mesh is 0.14 carats. That's my, that's my number. If you look at this graph, it starts at 0.14 carats. There's a two millimeter square mesh sieve right there. This is the starting point for this diamond size distribution that you see over here. So you have to ask yourself this question. If you had to fit this diamond size distribution, which by the way, is the only one that's published that goes into the 100 carat size range and approaches a diamond size distribution for 500 carat stones. There is no other diamond size distribution published like this. Then you have to ask yourself this question. Do you wanna fit it with a curve that looks like that? Or do you wanna fit it with a curve that looks like that? These two graphs are essentially the same graphs. There's carats per stone on the X axis. This one's just given in cumulative frequency. This one is a, a different version of, of, of cumulative frequency, percent carats larger than Z. If I judged by I, I would much rather fit this curve with a compound, a compound log normal um, a, um, a curve than I would with a straight line curve. However, we can break it down into straight line segments. That's what that looks like. Here's one. Two, three, four. Very simply put, from this perspective, there are four diamond populations represented in this size frequency distribution curve from, let's say. You can break up this curve into four, four two parameter log normal, log normal distributions. One, two, three, four. Or you can try and fit all this data with a complicated um, uh, fit sequence. The choice is yours. Um, I think it's undeniable that you that 
you cannot use a single two-parameter log normal distribution to describe this data set, no matter what you do. That's, a, that's, that's fairly obvious. Um, the next thing to point out on this diagram is that micro diamonds in general are less than two millimeters in size. In other words, your micro diamond data set is going to be sitting down here in this part of the diagram. And I want to use this diagram just to explain the benchmark concept. So if you happen to have a micro diamond size frequency distribution, that is a straight line at less than two millimeter size, uh, sizes, uh, you'll be able to use those micro diamonds to predict this part of the curve up to about, I don't know, up to what's that? That's about a carrot in size. And from there onwards, your prediction would be wrong because you're using a two parameter log normal distribution. In order to have a reasonable representation of what might be going on on the coarser stone, size, stone sizes, you actually have to have some data. And those data come from the macro size frequency distributions that we get out of bulk sampling programs or mini bulk sampling programs. And they often go up to about six carats and occasionally you might get up into the specials class. So 10.8 carats is over there. There's the 11 carat mark. And in this case, if you had to do that for a thing, um, you'd end up with a bulk sampling results that will fall somewhere along here. And if you then integrate your micro diamonds from let's say with your macro diamonds, in your bulk sampling program, you will get a curve that has a step function in it over there and it starts bending towards a coarser stone size distribution over there. And if you use that as a benchmark and do a propagation of it, then you might have a chance of predicting a part of this curve over here, but you will definitely not uh, 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 predict in a true fashion what's going on in this part of the curve which is these special type two diamonds that come out of uh, let's say, because they are a completely different population of diamonds. They are not represented in this part of the curve. So anybody who, who, who is going out there and saying, oh, we can use micro diamonds to, to try and constrain this part of the, of the data set, I think they are, they're speculating. They're not following the published data that we know that is representative of the Metsync system and the di different types of diamonds that are present uh, in that system. But we have now developed this benchmark concept, which is you take a micro diamond data set, you correlate it with the macro diamond data set that, that is spatially coincident um, and part of the public domain data set you might get up to about 10.8 carats in that process. Um, and the predictive power may be a little bit beyond that, uh, but it certainly wouldn't go into the 100 carat, uh, 100 carat mark. Uh, I never intend that it would be used in that way. So I'm going to just leave that uh, uh, there um, and go look at which micro macro diamond benchmarks uh, do we now have currently available to us as a result of the public uh, uh, data set that I've compiled? Um, and there they are. Uh, I can't remember, we have about 30 benchmarks right now, covering the range three carats per 100 tons to uh, 680 carats per 100 tons. So three carats per 100 tons would be down here. 680 would be up here. Uh, that's Argyle by the way, uh, this is some other uh, low grade stuff. And we can make some observations on this grade size on, 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 on this graph over here. It's a grade size plot. It's not a size frequency distribution plot. Um, so grade is diamonds per ton. That's the grade portion. Size is mean diamond size. That's on the X axis. 
Uh, the y-axis is assay counts per ton, diamonds per ton. There is no unit interval normalization. This is very important. A lot of people use something called spituri plots, stones per ton per unit interval. I've removed the unit interval and I'm able to do so because all these data have been converted to root two sieve classes. The advantage of doing that is that the distance between two points on this graph is constant. If you have root two sieve size data, then your data points are equally spaced on a log scale. That's very important in terms of fitting curves and being able to predict them reliably to coarser stone sizes. The x-axis covers the range from micro to macro diamond weights. So micro diamonds are down here, up to about sort of two millimeters, something like that. The macro diamond weight range goes through sort of the one carat class. And you'll notice I stop all my curves at 10.8. I never put them any further because the data simply doesn't support it. Some of these curves stop at less than 2.8, at 10.8. That's around the four, the five carat mark. Uh, and some of these curves actually stop uh, at, at about two carats because I simply don't have data to extrapolate beyond that. Um, any extrapolation beyond that is in fact an extrapolation, it's not a fit to the data. So a grade benchmark then is a congruent micro and macro diamond data at a known recovered grade. It's an empirical fit which is treated as one homogeneous mixture of diamonds. It is not a model. This is a fit to the data. We have 30 benchmarks, uh, public domain data collated to end 2018. Um, and just a remark that uh, was first made by a guy called Ed Hotan in Anglo-American Research Labs. Um, he said, you cannot recover a fraction of the diamond. There is a count rate threshold that occurs at one stone per seed. Um, those thresholds, I'll show them to you in a moment. In fact, that's what's happening next. There's one stone per seed in eight kilograms. There's one stone per seed in 200 kilograms. There's one stone per seed in a ton of rock. That makes a whole lot of sense. This data point over here relates to the fact that you're going from one to 10 carats on a log scale. Um, if you want visibility of this part of the data set in your sampling program, then you have to have samples that are about a thousand kilograms for microdiamonds. If you want to constrain curves in this part of the spectrum, your sample sizes have to go above 200 kilos. Typically in the current um, environment, we use 200 kilogram sample sizes. I had a lot to do with that in terms of BHP and I'll acknowledge that a bit later, which gives us visibility up to this part of the curve. Uh, and you can start projecting uh, from that beyond. If you take small samples, your visibility or your reliable data set will be restricted and you will only be seeing things um, that are in the higher grade spectrum of the microdiamond data set, definitely not the lower grade spectrum. Okay, so let's look at um, uh, some real data. This came out of the uh, Snap Lake system, quite an interesting one, uh, 96 to 99. Um, and it has to do with the amounts of diamonds you recover as a function of sample weight. And early on in their exploration history, they took surface samples, they took small samples, uh, uh, mostly less than 100 kilos, that's in uh, blue. Um, and by January 99, they did a mini, mini box sampling program um, and with correlated micro diamonds. Uh, and some of those samples were up uh, in the higher uh, weight category, micro diamond samples. And then in August 99, they launched what they called the value recognition program, um, which entailed three or four core drills running night and day um, 
uh, to recover microdiamond data, uh, uh, you know, uh, recover core from depth in this uh, sheet-like system. Um, and they had very small intersections in the snap lake sheet, uh, which provided uh, small sample sizes, but the snap lake sheet varies in thickness and they had uh, other micro diamonds that came from thicker portions of the snap lake data set. So in 99, they produced a publicly disclosed data set that goes from very small sample sizes or up to very large sample sizes, uh, which overlays on their previous data sets as shown on this graph. A very, very interesting graph to look at um, from this perspective. The variability in your data is very high. The one sigma is very high uh, at small, uh, small sample sizes. As you approach roughly uh, 100, 100 kilos in this data set, that variability starts uh, decreasing markedly. Um, and as you go higher than that, it stays roughly the same. So the threshold for significance in terms of sample sizes at Snap Lake is somewhere above 100, uh, 100 kilos. Once you, once you get above that, uh, your data set starts uh, becoming uh, very predictable, uh, very constant, um, and sample sizes do not have an influence on the amount of variability in results that you get. So this is an illustration of something that is a, a more general case uh, in microdiamond sampling. Um, higher variance data can typically be ascribed to undersampling or small sample sizes. That's a, that's a, a very common issue uh, and it's very well illustrated by this data set. Um, you can also get low count rates and higher variance uh, at lower grades. Snap Lake isn't that low grade, so that's not a problem at Snap Lake. If you sample across domains or unit boundaries, uh, that's obviously uh, something that can lead to variability in your data set. There's something called intra-domain heterogeneity, which is not much discussed. Um, uh, it's very difficult to prove that without additional information, in particular geology. Um, Outliers occur and they contribute to higher variance. And then there's these extreme outliers, which we call nuggets in a statistical sense. Um, and we'll see the examples uh, discussed further on about what these things do to your microdiamond results. So let's go look at some data application of, of how we use these benchmarks that are now being developed. Um, we take some early diabetic data. This is 94, 95 drill core microdiamond data disclosed in a publication um, uh, by Curtis Brett and, and colleagues. Um, this is the data itself on the grade size plot uh, in solid black over here with individual microdiamond counts per ton on a log scale uh, in this dark curve over here. And you can see the distance between the data points on this curve is equal all the way across this range of diamond sizes, which in this case goes up to one carat. Um, and so it's easy to fit a line through these uh, because they are equally spaced in root two sieve classes. If you're looking for benchmarks, uh, to compare to the early diabetic data, the microdiamond data, then clearly this benchmark over here is not appropriate. You can see it actually diverges from the shape of this curve. That benchmark is not appropriate. And so you select three benchmarks. In this case, they're given in, 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 three, in pastel colors here. There's a slightly purple one, light blue one, and then a, a darker blue color. Um, these three benchmarks look appropriate to compare to that curve. And when you do compare it to that curve, simply with the raw data as it's shown. Up Herman, there. you're breaking up a bit. Uh, I don't know if it's at your end or our end. Maybe anyone, someone else can comment. Uh, maybe I should stop my video. That helps. Um, I was saying, if you compare this microdiamond curve for early diabetic uh, uh, microdiamond data, uh, to appropriate benchmarks. There are three benchmarks here. Then you would forecast grades 
extending up this way of about three carats per ton with a very large error. That's the one sigma error uh, as expressed as a percentage of the grade. If you take the same data and you eliminate these two slightly aberrant data points, you get a much lower um, uh, one sigma error, 10% or 8%, and a slightly lower grade. Um, that's fairly obvious. These things are sitting on the high side of this curve, um, but a very consistent prediction. And it turns out that was very close to the mine grade uh, early on in the Diabica, uh, in, in the A154 North um, system. So in terms of using the benchmarking approach to forecast the recovered grades, it, it seems a reasonable approach to take. Um, the trick about using that approach is that you, you get a handle on your errors. There's a very big difference to have a 30% error uh, relative to a 10% error. Um, and that's really the, the, the contribution that using benchmarks uh, makes to the micro diamond uh, exercise. Uh, in the same source, we also have data for Diabic A21, 170 kilo sample. That's a, quite a, a smaller sample. This is the same, this is the data set um, uh, on the same graph. We've used the same benchmarks. Um, and if you use them raw, you get these kind of grade forecasts with this type of error. Um, and if you eliminate uh, one of the data points, this one over here, you get the same grade range, but with a lower error. And it's because that data point lies off the standard curve. But if you use the benchmarking approach, um, you can identify that this is an aberrant data point and quantify the error reduction by removing that data point over there. So that's an example from, uh, from Dialic. We can go to an exploration project. Uh, this was the McKenzie project in the Northwest Territories. It was explored by Sanatana Diamonds at the time. Uh, look at the sample sizes here. In 2007, they collected a ton of micro diamonds from the Dharma kimberlite, which was, re, uh, which was then discovered, and 450 kilos from, from Dharma Uttar in 2008. This is the public domain, the microdiamond data that came, became available. Um, it turns out uh, we were able to use seven different benchmarks to inform where this microdiamond data set is relative to those benchmarks. If you use just the raw data, the grades you would forecast would, would be these ones with extremely large errors. Those large errors are attributable to these outlier data points. Those, those over there. And if you eliminate them for the Dharma case or the Dharma Uttar case in open circles, if you eliminate that, your grade goes from 0.41 with a large error to 0.23 with a smaller error. Um, and the same exercise for, for, uh, for Dharma itself, which is the triangles. If you eliminate those two data points over there, your grade goes from 0.78 with a very large error to 0.33 with a smaller error. So you can pick your poison. You can either have a high grade with a high uncertainty, or you can have a low grade with a, uh, with a, with a much reduced uncertainty. Um, the way I, uh, I use these data is I go for I go for these results because they turn out to be more reliable. What we learned from this example is this whole process of discretization with a single stone data. Notice this was a thousand kilogram sample. So these triangles, which is from the STA Dharma data set, which is a thousand kilograms, it's a ton. That's one diamond. That's one diamond. It's another diamond. It's single stone data. It's sitting on the larger seeds, um, and these are outliers. So we can formally highlight um, the outliers um, by calculating the variance associated with this data set. 
Uh, these are outliers, they're not nuggets yet. They're simple, they're simple single stone outliers. It's a recognized problem in microdiamond uh, uh, data sets and they contribute a remarkable amount of variance um, when you compare them to benchmark, known, known benchmark curves. Here's another example, um, new field resources from Sierra Leone. They uh, got a whole bunch of dikes. Uh, 2018 uh, drill core microdiamond data. When you drill a dike and the intersection is fairly narrow, you end up with small sample sizes. All of these samples, microdiamond samples, um, uh, are less than 100 kilos. They, they represent different dikes. There are four different dikes represented over here. And when you take small samples, you end up with noisy data. And that's what these curves are. These are four different dikes that have been drilled, and the data is noisy. Uh, it turns out there were 11 benchmarks available to us uh, to compare uh, against, this, uh, against this data set. We chose to just use three of them. It spans a whole range. Um, and when you do that comparison, you end up with a table over here. And by now, you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to isolate the outliers, those two over there, that contribute a large amount of noise to these two grade predictions. When you eliminate them, the grade prediction changes, but it has much higher reliability. However, quite interesting, um, I, you know, for the Kundu and Lando case, even though you took very small samples, uh, I did play around with what potentially are outliers. The grade doesn't change that much. Um, you do increase the resolution of your grade prediction, but not by much. And so outliers don't contribute a lot to the Kundu and Lando data sets, even though these were very small, uh, very small samples. Uh, that's just lucky. Um, you can see the Lando case is over here. That's a fairly smooth curve. This is potentially the only outlier that, um, or, 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 or data point that contributes to variance. The rest of this curve is quite smooth. Um, and I'm getting to the end of this talk now. Um, there's a new benchmark that's out there um, in August 2018, uh, Lukapa Diamonds put out a, um, a, a microdiamond data set for the Little Spring uh, Creek Lamprite that's in the West Kimberleys in, uh, in Australia. That's quite an unusual data set. There's 1,100 uh, microdiamonds larger than 75 microns in uh, uh, 177 kilos of core. There's the 75 micron bottom cutoff. Most of my benchmarks started, well, in fact, all of my benchmarks stopped at, at 106. Uh, this microdiamond data set on its own crosses a whole bunch of the benchmarks. And the, the, the implication is the extension would be somewhere down here. But I can only turn it into a benchmark once I have a macrodiamond bulk sampling result, which falls somewhere over here. And it took 100 tons out of there recovered 11 stones plus one millimeter for 0.28 carats recovered. That's that data point over there. You can now fit the benchmark through over here, the whole lot. That's what it would look like. It would be unlike any other benchmark that we currently have in the data set. And so it's a very valuable benchmark to have uh, for something that we wouldn't generally describe as a, a large, a, a fine stone size distribution. In other words, very high counts in small sieves, uh, very low counts in, in coarser sieves, and we're not even at a half a carat over here yet. Uh, so the projection of this curve to commercial sizes is not gonna look that good. There's another interesting data set to discuss. Uh, this comes out of the Mateti Dike in, in Lesotho. Uh, it was sampled in 2011 at surface. Um, seven samples, a total of about 1,400 kilos. These were 200, 200 kilos each per sample, roughly. And it gave you a data set in triangles 
which is largely hidden in by a subsequent data set, but there it is over there, and it peaks out over here. Subsequently, they drilled this dike to depth to expand the resource. Um, the dike isn't that, that small, but nevertheless, they only were able to recover 108 kilograms total out of 10 drill intersections. Uh, that was from core. Uh, that's in open circles. Perfectly matches the data for the surface sampling to depth. Brilliant data set to have. Um, but there's an interesting interpretation in this case. Um, in the background, there's a benchmark curve that fits this tangent over here. And that benchmark curve is 4.63 carats per ton. You would only be aware of that potential for this dike if you knew about these benchmark curves. And if you use that benchmark curve, your interpretation of this part of the data set would be that there's a systematic loss in the small stone size fraction, which is equivalent to diamonds being resorbed. And that's a repeat result. You've seen it from surface sampling, uh, 1400 kilos, You've seen it at depth from drill sampling, 108 kilos. I think that's very well substantiated. So I think that's uh, formally the end of that talk. The topics that we've covered, it's very crucial to realize these root two C, uh, uh, series square mesh sieve reporting standards that were implemented by the CIM in March 2003 have really standardized the, the microdiamond data set that's in the public domain. If you go through that data set and you start correlating co-located microdiamond and bulk sampling data, like I showed you for the Springs Kick lamp, lamp ride, uh, you can make up these benchmarks. Um, if you use those benchmarks, and I always use three of them at least, um, you can calculate the macro grade and the relative variance. Uh, that's a very, uh, that's a key contributor to, to quantifying what's going on in your data set. And in particular, outlying, identifying outliers um, and the effect of single stones on coarse sieves and what that has, has on, on your, your grade prediction. And it has a beneficial application in forecasting or order, auditing macro grades. Uh, at various stages uh, through the resource development cycle uh, for primary diamond deposits. Um, I'd like to acknowledge a, a number of people that were instrumental in my getting interested in, in microdiamonds. BHP Bulletin really supported a rollout uh, in, and embedding in their diamond program of, of microdiamond sampling strategy at a minimum 200 kilogram sample weight. Uh, Peregrine Diamonds introduced something called the Hornet Reverse Circulation Rig in October 2010. There's a little Hornet Rig. You could drill uh, two or three targets per day with this rig, uh, helicopter supported. Um, and the drill product came at, at you, you collected it over here, underneath a cyclone. Uh, and there were a number of issues that we had to resolve about micro diamonds. One, when you use a hammer bit, um, as is the case with this, this RC drill rig, it's air, it's air supported, it's not water supported. There's the compressors. Um, do you see diamond fractation by the, uh, uh, fragmentation by the RC hammer bit? The answer to that is yes, you do. Um, do you see diamond attrition in the RC air blast slurry return system, in you know, this system over here? Uh, the answer to that is we don't know. Um, do you see a uh, fractionation or concentration of microdiamonds through the cyclone? Notice the cyclone is spewing out finer material as smoke in the chimney, and the finer microdiamonds may be coming up there because there's a cyclone over here, guys. Um, and the coarser and heavier material is coming out over here. That's what we collect in our samples, and this stuff is lost to air. Uh, the answer to that is. Indeed, there is fractionation of microdiamonds 
through the cyclone system, this air cyclone system. And so we were able to correct for that. Um, uh, what size and weight of an RC sample must be collected to constrain, you know, a 50 carats per 100 ton grade potential to within a particular limit? Um, that limit is one that BHP said, we need our results to be accurate to this, to this threshold. And it made me start thinking about one sigma errors in microdiamond data. So they had a big, big uh, influence on, on how I view microdiamond data sets. Um, Jennifer Pell um, was a research collaborator. She did a lot of sense checking of the public domain data. Uh, Cliff Revering, who's an SRK colleague and sounding board um, on, on how to use these data sets, uh, also an important colleague at SRK. So thank you everybody for uh, taking my career into a different direction here and applying my skills. Um, any questions from those that saw the whole presentation? And, and Herman, I mean, just to put some um, sort of financial perspective to it, I mean, um, what, what, what would a program and, and a very ballpark figure, you know, cost to, to collect some of this data on, you know, some of these Kimberlites and, and in many cases quite, or several Kimberlites, you know, that, that you, you've done? In, in, an, in obviously an Arctic or a Canadian context where, as you show in the picture, you've got to fly and, you know, yeah. take your, your whole kit and rig with you. Yeah, look, um, uh, just in round numbers, um, uh, um, for the Chidliak project, uh, roughly, if you, you know, all the camp support and all of that sort of stuff, if you average it out in a sampling program, a tool sampling program for indicator yeah. minerals, we're talking a thousand Canadian dollars a sample, yeah. um, uh, processed with the results. So you know, all in for that enterprise, a thousand dollars Canadian a sample. Mm. Uh, Micro diamonds is not, uh, you know, it's it's not that easy to give it a pro program wide cost because um, you know, so every it's sample not, is different. Yeah. yeah, every yeah every sample is slightly different, but on a quartering program. Um, a 200 kilogram micro diamond sample is 50 meters of core, NQ core. And it may be distributed across, you know, a, a much larger interval that you've drilled, but it's 50 meters of NQ core. Uh, it'll give you 200 um, uh, uh, kilos and it will cost you $110 Canadian per kilo to process. Mm. So, um, you know, there's the drilling cost and so on, but uh, um, to get the micro diamond result is $110 a kilo uh, for 200 kilos. So that's $20,000. Yeah, and that and that's Canadian dollars. So that you know, around Canadian. bigger. I mean, that's that's plus 200,000 rand per sample. Yeah, but you heard Hilda Cronwright say 200,000 uh, 200 kilos yesterday. She said the cost to process 200 kilos through their lab. Was she gave a figure that she said four hundred thousand rand. Yeah. No, no it, it doesn't come cheap, but I mean, it, you know, it, it's it's very powerful data if you collect it um, systematically and professionally. Yes. Uh, look, it's it, it's become definitive. It's a standard for diamonds for diamonds these days, in particular because of the reporting requirements and so on. It's uh, yeah. If you're in this game and you're not collecting systematic microdiamond data, you, uh, you'd be you'd be remiss. Yeah, and I mean just so, to just to add just to add to it, I mean you'd obviously be doing you know the indicator minerals or the minerals and whatever else you can, including petrography on on the same samples or portions of the sample. Yes, the same samples or portions of the same sample, representative sampling is very important. But I, I, I just want to reshare um, um, a part of the last talk. Uh, uh, just, uh, John, the context for doing both microdiamonds and kimberlitic indicator minerals is this context. Yeah, absolutely. Microdiamonds don't tell you where your kimberlite is sampling the mantle. They just tell you, this is how many diamonds you have in per kilogram of rock. 
They don't give you this perspective. Right? Look at this perspective yeah. that you get from, from the clonopyroxene data for this particular kimberlite over here, which is why I put that diagram up uh, earlier today. Um, this perspective you can only get from the silicate portion and the microdiamond data don't help you anything in this, in this space. Yeah. No, you've gone to all that effort. You've got to throw the book at it. Yeah, but you also you also learn a lot more about your Kimberlite province as a result of looking at this part of the data set. Herman, have you um, got data on on the size distributions of uh, pyrolytic versus eclogitic versus sublithospheric uh, diamond populations? Uh, or I, I presume that's pretty difficult to get. Yeah, it's quite selective actually. It turns out that most of the <laughs> Some of the some of the best data on on size distribution of diamonds in mantle xenoliths comes out of Derek Robinson's PhD. It's mostly Arapa eclogites, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, the academics that study diamond uh, diamond bearing xenoliths they simply don't measure the size frequency distribution. They're not interested in the size frequency distribution of of of, of mantle xenoliths, although. I have pursued when I see a particular academic has studied a, a diamond bearing xenolith, I've actually pursued that information on a semi-private basis uh, 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 from some of them. And that's why I was able to put that up for, you know, in the case of Tuawi, I have those examples. I know those numbers are good. Um, but you, you have to, you know, you have to do follow-up work. And Andy, you, you're no stranger to follow-up work. You, you follow up with people all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, I, th I think one of the interesting things, um, you know, for, from the uh, sublithospheric story for, for group twos was that um, the sublithospheric stones had, had all come out of um, Juina and, and they were very small stones. And um, and uh, you know when they when they screened a large number of samples at the GIA, they pushed that sublithospheric uh, population, whatever you might want to link it to, to you know to much coarser stones. Um, but the you know, and of course Duina was alluvial, so uh, I presume that complicated things as well. Um, you know, you get the impression that the 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 clippers are going to have a distribution that's um, skewed towards big sizes, which is you know what you said in in that graph. Um, uh, but it, it it would be something worthwhile doing, um, you know, to, to try and get that you know uh, um, get a systematic data set going. For the, for the different associations. Yeah, look, uh, you have to speak to the GIA for that. Um, you, know, uh, you know, people like me and you, we simply don't have access to those kind of diamonds. And that's, that's why the study by Evan Smith, you know, is so seminal because nobody else had access to that, to that material. Well, it, it, it asks all sorts of, interesting questions because uh, there's you know the whole question of how you get a 10 carat stone some of those stones were going up to 10 carats i don't, know, don't recall what the, that actually had but some of those sublithospheric stones were coming from 600 kilometers you know based on the inclusions so that's asking all sorts of questions about kimberlite emplacement and how the hell do you get those things up to the surface? Yeah, I'm not going to speculate on that. What I know is that they occur at surface. <laughs> and and who's who? I mean, just a very general question. I mean, who who's left driving exploration in in Canada at this at this point in time? Is it still juniors or or mostly? Yes, there are some juniors, we can call them in Afrikaans bitter enders, 
um, uh, uh, Buddy Doyle is 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 still uh, doing stuff uh, on the slave. Um, uh, what's that? Uh, North Arrow is doing quite a bit of um, uh, work on a very selective basis um, uh, across large parts of Canada. There is new there is new interest um, in Ontario in some of the Ontario Kimberlites. Uh, it's juniors again. Many of the race, sort of the more recent um, uh, uh, pieces of work are around established resources that were previously uh, declared at inferred level. Um, and then people taking that on and, and, and having a, another look at it. Um, much like the development was uh, in Northern Lesotho that started about 10 years ago. Yeah. So new, new look at, at old resources. Yeah, and I mean Rio Rio is really just set on on having a good look at Star, you know, an existing project. They're not doing any exploration work. Yes, that's correct. So that's uh, yeah, I, I forgot about that. You know, they're on the in the major space. Yeah, that's what that's what Rio is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, mate. Maybe you want to just um, stop sharing your your okay. slideshow and let's just have a quick quick wrap up. Um, you, you mentioned some important um, references there. In due course, I'll, I'll come back to you and just um, get a you know get a list of the half dozen or so that are are really you know critical, and we can circulate those those to all the students and in fact all the audience. You know, some of us need a refresher as well. And and sure. yeah. and likewise, your your YouTube clip of your presentation you gave end of last year on on the uh, micro diamond study as well yeah the I most mean, interesting the most interesting part of that youtube video is uh, is the, steve haggerty is, is the intervention by steve <laughs> <laughs> yeah it got quite colorful <laughs> okay. Herman, any any comments on victor for instance i mean victor was a very singular diamond population, relatively coarse, um, you know, a few micro diamonds, um, <clears throat> you know, in consideration of what you were saying about, um, you know, many of those smaller diamonds coming from, uh, I think it was peridotite nodules, whereas the coarser diamonds you, you, the example you gave was coarser mm -hmm. diamonds coming out of uh, eclogite um, nodules. Yeah, so uh, there's sort of several different sort of questions there. Let's just de uh, deal with coarser and finer diamonds. It's a general observation, and and Farnes for Yun um, has has put that in the public domain, as did um, uh, uh, John Gurney initially. That that diamonds that you find in eclogite zinnias in general are coarser grained uh, and in general of higher quality than diamonds that you see in equivalent prototypes and more and more or less that is that is generally held out by the work that people like jeff harris has done through the years and also that um that thomas stachel is doing this so, so it is a generalization, so you will get exceptions, um, but that's a very, it's a very good and a very, very sound generalization. Um, now, how that actually applies to Victor, where we did see very coarse diamonds and of very high quality um, without very many small diamonds, um, um, you know, that's the domain of, of the beers. That mine is now closed. And they have they have permitted publication of information which which addresses that topic. And it's this uh, diamond inclusion data set that's come out, but there are five other papers uh, about diamonds from Victor, which discusses their carbon isotopes. Um, and, the, you know, when they grew, which uh, they grew at 720 million years, um, um, that changes a whole lot of concepts that we, that, that we carry from the Kobzal and it changes it in this way. Um, basically, it's saying that 
diamond growth is a is a repetitive is a cyclic um, 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 situation we can see many different cycles of diamond growth the younger cycles of diamond growth are often associated with eclogodic um, uh, uh, dominated inclusions and they are tied to geodynamic cycles so the geodynamic cycle that caused uh, 720 million year old carbon deposition uh, in the central superior craton actually started at 1100 million years when there was a rift there uh, or a rift 600 kilometers south of there and then that craton cooled and it was exposed to a new cycle of, of carbon bearing fluids um, and those provided the mineralization that eventually resulted in the Victor mine. So it's, yeah, that um, was, I mean, I'm, I'm really getting back to, you know, Herb's presentation the other day, um, mm -hmm. you know, where he was talking about how the uh, superior craton, you know, was assembled and, and, and so on. And, uh, you know, it's just striking that Victor has, you know, a different diamond uh, population to what you would normally see, what we see in other kimberlites, you know, is mm -hmm. it? You know, it's not by model, if you want to put it like that. That's not the proper description, but yeah, it's very, it's very unique population. I, I think the uniqueness lies in the fact that those diamonds grew very young. Yeah. So that maybe has implications for the superior craton as well in terms of, in terms of prospectivity. You're looking for a different oh, yeah. type of animal. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. There is a general lack of kimberlites on the superior craton, which is the biggest craton in the world. Yeah, no, that's right. And, <laughs> uh, you know, um, but Renard has got quite high quality diamonds as well, though not, to the, not as good as uh, Victor. Yeah, there are some very high quality diamonds at Renard, but a lot of, uh, a lot of lower quality diamonds as well. Yeah, yeah. And and Snap Lake Herman, I mean that was just um, the failure of that was just it was just too complicated to, to complicated to mine. I mean you know mining mining dikes is tough enough as Jim will tell us. Jim, mm -hmm. um, you know mining the sort of wandering soil was going to be doubly difficult. The biggest issue there was the water. Yeah, it's underneath. It was Under underneath a big lake uh, and in 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 a fractured terrain. Um, and so that lake had many, many different ingress paths. And every time you took a ton out of a stope, it was replaced by huge volumes of water continuously. Uh, and that was the biggest single, single issue. Yeah. And, and there, there's an interesting question from um, Quinton, and I discussed it with him this morning. But, um, in, information classification for for websterites. Do you have something you can send us? I mean, it's um, not it's not the most sort of you know typical interesting mineral in the broader scheme of things, or not not yeah. uh, xenoliths. Um, yeah, so uh, sort of websterites have, have become a class of their own. They were originally sort of. Uh, included in the diamond inclusion studies as part of the eclogite fraction. Yeah. But as people started recording more things that didn't quite look like eclogites, they then started classifying them uh, Websteritic diamond inclusions. And there's actually a very good paper by Sonia Albach um, okay. and also um, um, uh, Dave Phillips started messing around with Websteritic, uh, Websteritic garnets. And I believe also Farnes Fulun has a very good uh, paper on Websteritic. Uh, okay, good uh, stuff. Um, we'll dig those out. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so they, they have come out uh, in, of, of their own in the past sort of 15, 20 years, yeah. Mm. So just a, comment uh, on, just a comment on that is that you, you you have the problem that chemically there's a strong overlap with uh, the megacris suite 
and uh, I didn't put it up when I talked, but um, with with those so-called Websteritic uh, framer sites um, from the Vienna collection, if you do your magnesium titanium plot, uh, it straddles, you know, the Megachrist uh, Websterite uh, plot. So um, I, I think uh, the, I think there's a problem using just a simple chemical uh, criteria, or, or at least using chemical criteria to try and distinguish between megachrists and websterites. And, uh, but I think uh, at least a, a fair proportion of the websterites are going to actually be megachrists. Yeah, for sure. Okay, anyway, I mean, there, there are some people out there who worked on them and we'll, we'll dig those out for you, Quentin. In, in, any other questions? Oh, I see Tabang has asked a question that's very difficult to answer. <laughs> Tabang asks, hi Herman, may you kindly recommend any literature relating to the use of micro diamonds for geostatistical valuation? Tabang, uh, you know, I've tried to I've tried to make my way through the available literature. The available literature is an academic literature. It's not a, a, a commercially applied literature. And it's so divorced from the microdiamond data sets that I'm used to working on that I ultimately uh, ultimately gave up on how the academics look at the enterprise of microdiamond um, um, use from a geostatistical point of view. What I can uh, recommend to you is um, uh, Johan Ferreira has a PhD thesis that's uh, available uh, in, uh, in the public domain. Uh, it's through... Yeah, I've got a copy of it. Um, yes. I mean, I'd, I'd gladly circulate it. It is yeah. available if you Google it as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's a very good summary of where we are. And Johan obviously has had a long history of actually dealing with the practical side of microdiamonds. Um, and describing that from a geostatistical point of view. So it's much more useful uh, in terms of the diamond industry in, in an applied sense to, to go to that work uh, than to just simply go look at what academics say about the enterprise. And, and I think to add to that, I mean, as you've done, you know, you've actually got to work with the data and go and plot it and play with it. And, and you know, probably also listening to your your talk of late last year, you know, will help as well. So we'll, we'll circulate that to everyone. You know, just, just trying to learn micro diamond sort of trends and data from, from the books is, is very difficult. You actually need to be working with the data. I think that works much better in, in my limited experience anyway. Yeah, and it's a whole different ball game uh, working with data on, an, on a log log plot. Wow, it really does change things. And in, in fact, you know, it's also it, it's been useful in in the alluvial business to you know study populations. Again, it's a log log plot, and obviously it's a slightly different population. But it goes back to your point as well that you know similar deposit or, or or an individual individual deposit has quite a distinct. Um, size frequency distribution and it's useful data. So, you know, that's another way of coming at it in the, in the, in the broader sense. Well, John, you know, you know, the thing about alluvial diamonds are they are well sorted. That, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so, so if you want to, if you want to you know, look at size frequency distributions and you want stable data, the place to go is the alluvial data sets. Lyndon, you're on the talk. You can. You're going to presumably throw in a few next week as well. Anyway, so so there there should be some some of these um, interesting plots come up and um, from the alluvial guys, Lyndon, Lyndon, and and ourselves put together a lot of good data over the years, and it's very useful. And I, I see that Jan Stefanoff has given us quite a useful background comment on Snap Lake and. You know, again, it just brings you back to uh, mining these things is always a practical financial challenge. So uh, 
you know, give some very good background there, but more than just the water. 